Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the guests and friends and participants who are following us from Facebook and YouTube Live. And thank you all for joining here today for this Food for Earth G20 edition event. I'm Sara Roversi, I'm the founder of the Future Food Institute, and I'm very proud to be here to celebrate this very important gathering but overall to start a conversation that we think is absolutely relevant for the time in history we are facing now. Before starting, I would love to involve our partners, our friends, because uh, this year we are very honored as Italy to host the G20 Summit. We consider the G20 Summit as well as all the summits that our country this year is going to host because in the next months ahead, we are going to have year COP26, but also next week in Rome is going to take place the UN Pre-Food System Summit. And so we consider our country like the crossroad of probably the most important conversation the world leaders are going to have in the next days, but not only conversations, because this is time for action. And we consider really this opportunity to connect not only the policymakers and the leaders, the broader society. So this is the aim of Food for Earth. The beginning of this journey, meetings that our country is involving youth, involving innovators, involve local policymakers, involve all the leaders in the food chain, but also connecting with the, the broader society and local communities. And so when we started talking about Naples, about the opportunity to talk about the food and climate, food and environment, food and energy, of course, thinking about Naples, uh, there were a local, very important stakeholders, that is the Città.
which is often not linked to the seasonality and territoriality and as costs, social, environmental, that have not been correctly quantified, the Italian agriculture has its made in Italy production, often make environment and social sustainability and strong point, but it's necessary to do better to be able to feed the planet by protecting natural resources, soil, water, and the biological resources, biodiversity. Not only at the level of production, but also with the food choices of the citizens, we are asked to implement the transition to achieve the One Health goal, protecting the entire ecosystem. In fact, the essential connection with the more general and comprehensive ecological transitions is evident, with which the need for a general transformation is highlighted, which must affect all sectors of life and the economy, changing the paradigm of our development model in order to reduce the impact on the environment while guaranteeing the level of well-being. The ecological transition, also no thanks to Hopkins transition in city movement, puts the emphasis on social and the local innovation of the resilient territories. We must be clear that that term of protection of the environment does not mean protecting only parks, greenery, and the fauna, but also means completely reforming our economic model, for example, with energy efficiency across all sectors and with an announcement of sustainable production. The rule of institutions such as these Città della Scienza becomes central to accompany this profound change that we are facing, in which the dialogue within science and societies becomes fundamental and indeed must be increasingly strengthened. We must set the necessary targets not only to be climate neutral, but the middle of the century, but also to significantly reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the next 10 years. If the world fails to drastically reduce CO2 emissions between 2020 and 2030, it will be almost impossible to stop the rise in global temperature or reach the goal of net zero emission by 2050, with all the dramatic consequences that this would lead to. This challenge is the norms, and it is clear that the only way to face it is to network and to make a system with all the protagonists without exception. Thank you, and all, and good work today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's uh, absolutely the reason why we are here. We consider the role of science absolutely the pillar of this conversation. And uh, now I really need to thank someone that is representing the organization that is hosting now here in Naples. Of course, the opportunity to host a summit like that in uh, all our beautiful Italian cities is an opportunity for our country. But the idea of hosting uh, all of those uh, meetings uh, also in uh, undercover location, it's something I think quite a gift or a blessing. So Città della Scienza very generously said, why don't we invite all our guests in a very special location that is not one of those locations that you can easily find and they connect us with Fondazione De Felice. And so I would love Roberto Fedele to share something because this place needs to be underlined, I think, for the importance and the historical importance where we are. Buongiorno. Benvenuti nel teatro di Palazzo Dormano, un luogo storico, straordinario, un luogo che ha fatto la storia di Napoli. Uh, teatro nell'accezione spagnola, luogo di feste, luogo di incontro, spazio ludico, 
per la corte vicereale di, del duca di Medina e di Anna Carafa. Un luogo poi rimasto abbandonato per secoli, fino a quando eh, negli anni 60 non viene acquistato dal professor Ezio De Felice, che lo restaura mirabilmente e, e da quella data accoglie fino al 2000 lo studio di architettura del professore De Felice. Il professore De Felice lascia la volontà testamentaria di destinare questo spazio barocco straordinario a sede della Fondazione Cosmoria. Eh, e oggi la Fondazione custodisce l'archivio della produzione scientifica e professionale di Ezio De Felice, vedete alla vostra sinistra, alla vostra destra, tutto l'archivio del professore che viene regolarmente consultato da studenti e studenti. Eh, ma c'è di più, oltre a custodire l'archivio del professore e organizzare eventi sul campo dell'architettura e della scienza, e si riferisce a lasciare una volontà, direi, etica più ampia, perché la sua idea è stata quella di aprire alla città uno spazio straordinario come questo, che per secoli è stato di uso e godimento privato dalla famiglia Carafa in poi, questo spazio era vissuto e goduto da privati. Grazie alla volontà di De Felice oggi siamo qui e il godimento di questa sala è diventato di uso collettivo, con i nostri amici, con i nostri partner, con la città della scienza oggi. E in questo senso siamo veramente felici di ospitare un evento internazionale di grandissimo rilievo, perché in questo modo noi abbiamo forma e sostanza alla volontà di De Felice di aprire alla collettività questo spazio. Grazie e benvenuti. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the hospitality and for the opportunity to see this little jewel in, in the heart of Naples. So now we have to start to debate and think and highlight which is the importance and the nexus between food and climate, energy, and environment. With Future Food, when we started this journey, was before the SDGs were announced, before the Paris Agreement was signed, before the World Expo taking place in Italy, I lighted the deep connection between food, energy, and climate, and life. When we started, we wanted really to start to connect the dots and bridge all the gaps within the food chain, understanding that there were this need. Then in 2015, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals were announced. Always in 2015, the Paris Agreement was signed. And always in 2015, our country had the chance to host the first global event, for the first time talking to normal people, to families, kids, schools, about food, feeding the planet energy for life and for the first time normal people started to be aware about the deep connection of our food choices with the impact we're making on the environment of course the pandemic had an incredible role because the pandemic has been accelerating many of the say the the the, the, the say the, the hardest and deepest uh, um issues we are facing in the global food systems, but also the pandemic had the power to make the invisible visible. And we suddenly understood that we need to take action. And in Italy, I would say, we took this inspiration, also calling an entire ministry, the Ministry of Energetic Transition, Green Transition. We need to make this transition, as you were saying. And so now we are taking this uh, inspiration and we want to try to accelerate this transition as much as we can. Together with the Food and Agriculture Organization that is a partner inside the Food for Earth initiative, we started really underlining which are the deep connection between food and the society. And within the Food for Earth framework, we started identifying which are the deep connection between humans and ecosystems, so identifying the issues of creating climate smart ecosystems, how we can foster uh, 
regenerative life, a circular living approach. Highlighting the importance of food identities and using food as a tool to heal the society, as a tool for inclusion. And then talking about prosperity and food diplomacy, because nobody highlights how many issues are behind the entire global food system, how many political issues. And it's time to make those very complex uh, uh, topics uh, understandable for normal people. So what we are really trying to do is trying to make uh, the complex food system understandable for everyone. So now I really thank the president of Fondazione Città della Scienza and the entire team of Città della Scienza, Futuro Remoto, and our partners here in Naples, Fondazione De Felice, for hosting us today. And I want to start to jump into our conversation. As you know, our event is part of the side event of the G20 Summit, but also is one of the side events of Connect for Climate. That is the initiative that our Minister of Ecological Transition is uh, hosting all over the country for the entire year, supporting the journey from now up to COP26, the free COP26 that is going to be hosted in our country. And now I would love to involve our first guest that is connected online, that is Professor Riccardo Valentini from Città della... But before jumping to that, we have uh, Sabato Dauria from CNR. And so we have uh, digitally Marina Riccaboni from CNR. As you know now, with this new life, we are dealing with uh, this kind of events uh, that are partially digitally, partially in presence, uh, and we are learning a new way of interacting also <laughs> in this kind of events. Okay, so let's invite our guest here present uh, today. I would love to involve, first of all, Gramenos Marstroieni, here with me. We are in the heart of Mediterraneo. And so let's start to talk about Mediterraneo. Okay. We know how much is important Mediterraneo for Europe and for the entire world, I think. And so I really would love Ramenos, uh, that is the Secretary General of the Union for Mediterraneo, to really highlight. Uh, how critical is the role of Mediterranean overall when we talk about climate, energy, environment, and which are the challenges we are facing, what we can do? Yes, thank you, Sara. Good morning, uh, everyone. The challenge posed by climate change also through food to the Mediterranean is absolutely critical. And the Mediterranean in turn is uh, critical for the balances of the whole world. If you look at our region, it is the place where three continents join together. Africa, Europe, and Asia converge all on the Mediterranean. So what happens on, in the Mediterranean is bound to reflect on uh, global balances. Climate has already taken a toll. If we think about Arab Springs in uh, 2011, we were happy to interpret them as uh, a healthy aspiration to democracy. And there's a part of truth in that. But we cannot forget that the Arab Springs were preceded by four years of strife in the streets, which had nothing political, nothing ideological. These were disorders because of bread. Prices of food commodities had gone up four times and climate change played a role, not directly on the region. It played the role on uh, 
big producers of cereals like Ukraine, Australia, the United States. But then the southern part of our region depends a lot from imports. And uh, this increasing price, which was also de determined by climate, was one of the reasons why our region started to change its balances. A direct impact by climate was crucial also in the events in uh, Syria. The Syrian crisis has all its historical and political background. But the critical point was reached when uh, the impact of climate change determined four years of unprecedented drought. This coupled with a decision to shift the, the Syrian farming system towards cotton from uh, the old kind of farm, which was uh, a family farm. And considering that cotton drinks a lot of water, determined the movement of 1.8 million people from the countryside to the cities, exactly those cities where the disorders started. And now, now the Mediterranean as a whole is the second fastest warming region in the world, just after the Arctic. And the waters of the Mediterranean Sea are the fastest warming waters in the world. It is not only a problem for fishes or marine flora. It is not only a problem because the situation comes with a lot of this period, we will be confronted with 250 million people in water scarcity, or we are forecasting a very an accelerated sea level rise. One meter before the end of the century, that seems so far away, but up to 20 centimeters in around 12 years. 20 centimeters will not scare people. It's like that. What, make, what difference can it make? Maybe they think about fragile coastal cities like our, like our precious Venice, but the point is that 20 centimeters of salty water that gets into the land sterilizes agriculture. Our ancestors, the Romans, when they wanted to subjugate someone, they would uh, defeat them in battle. But if they wanted to never hear again about a certain population, they would just spread salt on their fields. Project this 20 centimeters on the delta of the Nile, which is the heart of the agriculture of a country that has 100 million people, roughly. Well, it would salinize the delta of the Nile and jeopardize the agriculture of this country. There are many, many other disquieting forecasts, but it would be a mistake to take this situation of the Mediterranean is a collection of severe but separate problems. What climate change is doing in our region is that it is completely reshuffling the balances and the very identity on which we uh, define who we are and what we want. Look at our region. It has something peculiar. If you look at Europe, you can easily conclude that it is a weird notion, something unusual. If we use the criteria through which we have defined all the other continents, Europe should not exist. It is just the westernmost tip of Asia. And look at the southern shore of the Mediterranean. It is Africa, but it is not Africa at the same time. There is a different identity here, and it's a connected identity between the north and the south. We are different from that, that surrounds us. We have an identity, but what is this identity rooted in? Well, already some time ago, Montesquieu, with his climate theory, understood that we are what we are. We have a special identity, although we are not really separated from the rest by geographical barrier, because we benefit from a special climate. And it is a very special climate. In our region, the Mediterranean, which is a large closed mass of water, acted as a stabilizer. And this made climate more predictable. With the predictability of climate came the predictability of natural cycles. And this was crucial in determining the most important revolution in our history. If you go around uh, asking people, what is the most important revolution in human history? Probably today they would reply the industrial revolution. Very important, but not as much as another revolution that occurred roughly 10,000 years ago. 
which was the agricultural revolution. It was the moment in which mankind shifted from being passive users of the ecosystem to managers of the ecosystem. And by the way, it happened here. It happened around the Mediterranean in the Fertile Crescent. It happened in Anatolia. It happened in Southern Europe. Not because here there were more clever humans than elsewhere, but because here we had very special and favorable conditions. Predictability of climate. When climate is predictable, you can start managing your lands. If nothing is predictable, you have no chance to manage. Together with the agricultural revolution came some of the first great civilizations. So this is the Mediterranean, and this is the Mediterranean which is at stake with this accelerated climate change and warming of the waters. The fact that the waters of the Mediterranean are warming very quickly, as I was telling you, is not only a problem for fishes or for fauna, it is a problem for the whole identity of the region because a mass of water that stores a huge amount of energy reverts its function. Before it was a stabilizer, but now releasing energy, it becomes a machine of chaos, of unpredictability. So the comparative advantage of our region is to be gone. And also the fact that we once had a climate that united in a certain identity, various groups, but now is changing, is posing more fundamental threats than water shortage or drought. We've just seen Europe as defined by its climate. Well, the, the unity, the relative unity of this climate doesn't exist anymore because one pillar of our climate, which was the Azores anticyclones, including a region and bringing the good weather, doesn't exist anymore. It is now driven away by Saharian anticyclones. And it seems so abstract, so climatologic, but it is actually fundamental for our identity because these intrusions split Europe in two. And this means that certain things we had in common, including interests, now are divided. I'll give you a, a small example. We are the second fastest warming region in the world, but there is one that is warming even faster, which is the Arctic. It comes with many problems, but also possibly with some advantages. Among them, the opening of new maritime routes on top of the Northwest Passage and on top of the Northeast Passage on uh, Siberia. These routes, when they become viable, they represent a lot of money. They are currently est estimated at $11 billion a year. We're very happy if our Northern friends have at least some advantages together with all the trouble. But if these routes become viable, it means that the Suez Canal has no more value. It is the passage for 22% of international commerce. It wouldn't pass there anymore. It would pass on top of Siberia. So things that seem so abstract and scientific are already dividing us. But the good part is that there are also new phenomena with a different climate that are uniting us. Take uh, a sector, and I see that my friend Mauro Centrito is listening, which is never considered, but it's absolutely fundamental, which is forestry. Forestry moves a lot of money, but it's never in the news. Well, in the forestry sector, we have witnessed in the last 10 years to a spontaneous increase in cooperation between the North and the South. It was not a government's decision. It was spontaneous. Why? Because people in the forestry sector are aware of uh, ecological implications also. But above all, because species which are viable now in the South will be the one species that will save our agricultures and forests in 10, 15 years. So what lesson can we draw from this? It's an extreme threat, but it could be reverted into an extreme opportunity. Science, not policy, not ideology, tells us one thing. No one around the Mediterranean, not even the strongest, have enough means to face such a shift so fast, so vast, on its own. We need each other. I need your species. Maybe you need my computers. I need your technology. And I'm thinking about the South, because when we think about technology transfer, we always have in mind the industrial countries giving some gifts to other countries. It is not true. Who has experience in managing drylands? Who has a 4,000 years experience in managing drylands? It's not us. It's in the South. If you go in the South, you see buildings in which they manage to keep temperature below zero without spending one single 
just using the wind, its houses, its uh, stock places, and things like that. We need, we want to go green in Europe, carbon neutral. We cannot do it without the renewables potential of the south shore of the Mediterranean. We need solar potential of Morocco and Egypt if we want to use green hydrogen to become carbon neutral in the European Union. So to make a long story short, we are in front of an extreme threat. But if we face it in the only sensible way, which is suggested by science, not by policy or by ideology, that is, we should build a cooperative economy. One in which we put together everything that we do, that we have. But if we do that, not only we diffuse climate change, but we do one more thing. Look at our wonderful region. It was the cradle of civilization of a lot of knowledge, but it has never been a sea of peace. We are not a region of peace because we are a region of asymmetries. A region in which there are rich people and poor people. Just to give you one example, take international exchanges around the Mediterranean. 90% take place among North Rim states. 9% between the North and the South and only 1% among South Rim states. Well, this is the real reason why we are still in conflicts. Ideologies, Functional interest history is just the surface, the foam on top of it. Well, if we do what we need to do to build that kind of economy that will finally bring to our region peace. Thank you so much, Gramenos. You set the right development goals, partnerships, partnership for the goals. We cannot achieve anything without working together. And now I think we have uh, here with us connected Professor Riccardo Valentini, professor at Università della Tuscia, but also Nobel Prize uh, in 2007 with the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. So it's been a long journey, many years. Your group, your research team has been telling us since decades how fast we should move to drive this transition. And now maybe it's time to act even more fast, even faster. Professor Valentini, I think you are with us. Yes, sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Can you listen to me? Good Hello? morning, Ricardo. Okay. Good morning. And uh, I like to share the screen if you don't mind briefly. Okay. I share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Do you see my screen? Hello? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for this, uh, for this invitation to this very important uh, meeting. Um, I like to start from uh, one, uh, one uh, kind of uh, very provocative picture that is a, a, a field of wheat in the middle of Manhattan in New York. And I think this is, uh, a little bit of the symbol of where, where we are today in our, in our discussion on the future of Earth and the role, important role of food and agriculture. We need really more space, more space. We need to increase our production. We need to provide food for uh, so many billions of people in the recent future. And uh, we also discussed the ecological transition is a very important keyword today, but maybe a transition is not enough. Uh, we need to introduce another word, the metamorphosis that I like to use, uh, meaning that we have to really be unconventional and to be really very fast and quick to take transformation in our society, particularly in the food system that is so central to many, to many policies, including the climate, uh, the climate policy itself. Uh, and uh, we know that there are many challenges. One is important is about uh, feeding people uh, that is growing up to uh, possibly 9 billion in 2050, but more than the number is the quality of population. There will be more and more people living in cities. 80% uh, of uh, people will live in 
urban areas. And this uh, creates also another challenge for the food system. So how to feed the people that don't grow food, but they just eat. And that's a really a big challenge uh, compared with the history of our humanity. Second challenge is about land. We know that we have so, so shortage in land. We, just, we already have uh, uh, appropriated the something like uh, 73% of the total land surface for human use. Uh, we are so we left just with about 27% of land for the future. And we have also about uh, 30 million of hectares of deforestation every year, more than the Italian forest area that is 10 million. So uh, how do we going to really increase the land for the future? And that's a, a, big, a big challenge for all of us. And finally, uh, we also have to uh, recognize that uh, we have uh, a big problem in the food systems because we have a true uh, something like uh, 900 million, 868 million people uh, without uh, food, so in, uh, undernourished. But we have uh, 1.5 billion of people that are overweight and obese. So uh, how we can uh, fit these two things, it's a paradox, because at the end we have something like 30 million people dying because for, for malnutrition or for excess of food. So we have also the excess of food that we have to consider. Um, and also we produce not only food, we use land for producing, for example, biofuels. And it's again another paradox. So if we need the land for food, why we should produce biofuels? And finally, uh, the third paradox is the, the food waste. We have about 40% of food is wasted in different ways at the level of consumers or in the, in the food supply chain uh, system so that we lost something like 30% of food. And finally, climate change is uh, also another uh, important uh, pressure on, the, on the, our production. So I want to just make a point here that uh, there is a role of, uh, of uh, agriculture and climate policy. Yes, for sure. Uh, climate policy is now becoming um, not just an energy problem, uh, particularly if you look at uh, the carbon neutrality question. And uh, in, we know that about 37% of greenhouse gas emissions today can be attributed to the agricultural sector starting from the farm to the fork, as we use in Europe, this is the wording. Uh, and so it's a, a relevant, important element. If you look at the current estimates, a couple of papers came out uh, with uh, two estimates uh, about the role of agricultural sector, uh, considering the, 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 full, the full chain, we, we, we have something like uh, uh, 14 billion of tons of CO2 or uh, 17, 18 billion of tons of CO2. These are the two estimates uh, for greenhouse gas emission that is more or less equivalent to the emissions of the electricity and heat sector. So it's really uh, important to see that there is this uh, uh, this equivalent or, or most uh, between the uh, food system sector and the energy classical traditional sector. So something we have to do to make our food system more sustainable and more climate friendly. And uh, this is the big discussion that also we're having in Europe and uh, the, the targets of European climate policy are uh, quite uh, challenging. Uh, recently, the 55% emission reduction since 1990 has reinforced the Paris ambition by EU uh, and zero net emissions by 2050. But if you look at the agricultural sector in Europe, uh, it has uh, um, it has not followed the the, the great uh, the great uh, indeed result of the European energy uh, climate policy because uh, you remember in the uh, strategy 2000. 2020, we already achieved the target. Actually, it was 20% emission reduction, but we achieved in 2020 even 23%, more than the target. So EU is doing a lot in different sectors to uh, reduce the burden of climate change, but the food system is lagging behind because if you look at the CO2 emissions per capita, uh, in 2010, we had something like 11 tons per capita uh, for uh, for uh, total uh, CO2 emissions uh, for energy and mobility and so on, uh, and we de decreased in 2018 to 9.5. Uh, in um, in the sector, only the sector of agriculture, 
uh, we have had an increase actually of uh, CO2 emissions uh, equivalent per capita due to the food. So the food has increased the emissions. So the agricultural sector is lagging behind, uh, is not, is very resistant to changes, very resistant to modernization, to change of paradigms. So it, there's a lot of work to do to make it uh, more uh, sustainable and, and contributing to, to uh, the climate policy. And finally, we, if you look at our diets, our, how do we eat in EU, uh, this is a really big, big uh, uh, gap of uh, what we should do uh, uh, indeed. So because if we, if we take that, ideally, we should have an average of 2.3 kilograms to two uh, equivalents um, per capita. Uh, uh, that is what has come out from the, for example, the Eat Lancet report and from other studies on the sustainability of, of contribution of food to greenhouse gas emissions. This should be our target, indeed. Uh, in reality, EU, we eat uh, double, 4.5 kilograms CO2 equivalents per, per, per capita per day. So that's a uh, a big gap to fill in to reduce so we have to reduce our for example, meat consumption or to to improve uh, the, 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 the let's say the sustainability of farm production uh, reduce the waste so we have to do a lot of things uh, to uh, stay within the, the planetary boundary that is something like 2.3 kilograms of co2 uh, and finally it's not an easy task because we need uh, to combine uh, all the system together so we should uh, uh, think at the agri-food system as a, you know, more holistic way from the farm to the consumers indeed. And, uh, um, and we need to improve uh, the knowledge, the education, so the scientific uh, data on what we eat, what is the impact on, on, the, on, on the environment, uh, but also to, to work on accessibility in terms of uh, uh, relief, relieving the barriers that we have today, also economic barrier, for example, social barriers to access to food and facilitation, of course, uh, uh, also the, the disease. So that's are three important pillars of our challenge that is not yet there in place. And finally, I want to make just the last point that is uh, whatever we do in Europe, uh, has to be uh, included in a global dimension. Why? Because uh, uh, you see this graph is showing the embedded emissions uh, that we uh, uh, basically import or export in Europe. And of course, uh, we import more than export. So we import more emission than what we export. And this is why Europe is uh, considered, let's say, um, uh, very sustainable. Count, uh, country, region, or the world, uh, so we can do what we want in terms of uh, reducing the emissions of our uh, agricultural sectors, or local local products and local production and farming. But if we import food that is uh, uh, largely uh, emitting uh, greenhouse gas emissions, as we do uh, today, uh, it's very difficult to obtain uh, a good result. So the, this is why we should include the world, the global the global market dimension in our uh, climate policy cannot be just uh, EU to uh, solve, for example, in this case, the food emissions problem, because uh, we are all interconnected. Uh, well, there are a few conclusions. Uh, it's important to reconnect the, the food systems all together, the actors of the food chain. We, we need to include also the externalities of emissions and the, the cost of food. That is an important discussion G20 about the border emissions, for example. It's very, very relevant to the food system as well. Uh, focus in urban areas is very important. How we solve, we have solutions. We have to find solutions for urban areas. Um, mitigation and adaptation through technology is also very important in a circular economy as well. So thank you for your attention and uh, let's uh, try to hit better and help the planet with our food. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria Lini. Always a brilliant and inspiring. Uh, and for letting us understand uh, how fast we should run. Wow. Thank you so much for being with us. And now we are still connected. I would love um, to invite here the Center for Research. I think Marina is connected. Yes. So we <laughs> yes. have here Marina Sumani, the director of ISACOM uh, from the National Center of Research. 
thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to be here today, and uh, I would like to extend greetings on behalf of Tino Dauria, uh, the director of the Department of Biology, Agriculture, and Food Science of the Italian and National Research Council. Unfortunately, uh, Tino uh, could not be present today due to previous uh, commitments. Uh, the teams that are uh, being debated today are of the greatest importance, uh, food for health, uh, food as a right for all the people on earth, how to ensure uh, the uh, ecological transition of agri-food systems uh, to feed and at the same time protect uh, our planet. For sure, research needs to play a big role in these challenges. And uh, the Italian National Research Council is uh, committed to research tackling various uh, topics uh, related to the ecological transition. This commitment to ecological transition is strongly pursued by our president, Professor Maria Chiara Carrozza. Uh, I would like to say that our department, uh, through the activities of the nine institutes that take part uh, to it, is engaged in research to develop an innovative and sustainable agri-food system able to uh, ensure food, water, and energy to a constantly growing population. Uh, our researcher cooperates with uh, farms, uh, firms, uh, to develop jointly solution uh, able to encompass both productivity and uh, sustainability. Um, the importance of the research topics related to the uh, agri-food production has been also uh, confirmed by the Italian National Research Programme in 2021-2027, which is the document orienting the politics for research in our country. Uh, just, just in conclusion of my very small presentation. I would like to say that to tackle the big challenge of the ecological transition, to ensure to feed and protect our planet, it will be more and more necessary <clears throat> the commitment of all the components of the human society. I would like to wish you all a fruitful meeting and I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Marino Buffati. And now, after we are really understanding how important is deep space to science when we're talking about those issues, I want to start to connect the dots and take inspiration from what Germanos Mastorini was saying before. We need to develop a cooperative economy to accelerate the transition. And I want to start to talk about uh, this approach in the food sector involving uh, Simona Caselli. Simona Caselli has been uh, the Secretary for Agriculture of uh, the Emilia Romagna region. And for sure, Emilia Romagna region is one of the regions that counts a lot in terms of agriculture for the Italian country. But now she leads uh, an European organization. She's the president of uh, AREF. And I would love to ask to Simona, who has been leading a lot of the cooperative environment, how do you see this transition happening? And how do you see critical the role of Europe in this time in history? Because Europe, more than any other continent, is taking very strong responsibility setting very high goals for the food sector and a clear strategy, clear strategy for farmers. Much of science. Thank you, 
uh, for organizing this side event, which is a really interesting and, and an high level one. Uh, uh, I guess it was music for my years when I uh, that we have to use a shared economy because this is really the key, really the key uh, to, to cope with climate change and uh, also with uh, the, the, the great challenge of uh, producing uh, in a sustainable way enough food to feed 10 billion people uh, looking at 2050. Uh, so, um, first of all, I, I want to present my organization. Uh, I'm president of AREF. AREF is a European organization of regions. Uh, it's called the uh, European Assembly of the European Region for Fruit and Horticulture. So, we are in the fruit and vegetable system, uh, which is, of course, uh, absolutely involved in the, in the Green Deal and uh, in all European politics. Um, and we are in a way, uh, at the front of this particular situation we are experiencing during the pandemic, uh, but also with this idea of uh, uh, making uh, the, the fruit and vegetable consumption and sustainable production central for the future of, of humanity. Um, so, uh, yes, you, you are right. Uh, Europe has a, a strong politics now, it's been defined in 2020 presentation by uh, the Vice President Timmermans uh, uh, of the two strategies, uh, the, the Comfort Food Strategy and uh, the Biodiversity Strategy. Uh, recently, at the end of June, uh, the new CAP, um, the new Common Agricultural Policy was uh, adopted. Uh, formally, it will be adopted in October, but we know the framework already. Uh, so we now have the rules and we have a framework and, and the holistic view also, which is very, very important. The problem is uh, what Professor Valentini was reporting actually uh, emissions because uh, uh, Europe already is, uh, is a, a good level. Uh, even Europe can do better, of course, but uh, we also need to, to cope with this. G20 uh, can be useful for that, of course. And, uh, and I hope today and uh, tomorrow they will, they, will, uh, they will arrive at some uh, important conclusions. Uh, but uh, last, uh, last week, uh, the European Commission put in place uh, the, the CBAM system, for example, which is a, a system, a kind of uh, polluter import fee uh, that uh, from 2023 should be paid uh, on uh, imported uh, iron, steel, uh, fertilizers, and uh, various uh, activities which are considered uh, polluting. Um, this is partly due to the fact that uh, we need to, to create a, a, a level playing field for, for uh, uh, European uh, industry and European farmers, of course, uh, but also the fact that we, we have to accept uh, uh, we cannot continue to, to like this with gas emissions. So coming to, uh, to agriculture. Agriculture, as you know, and Professor Valentini showed us very, very well, is responsible at a global level of 15% uh, of, uh, of gas emissions. So it's not the main responsible sector. Um, agriculture is doing another thing, is uh, absorbing carbon also. Uh, this is estimated to be a 4%, but uh, it depends on where you are and uh, how much forest you have and so on. Deforestation is a big issue, but at the world level, because in Europe uh, we don't have a problem with uh, losing forest. Uh, we actually, uh, even in Italy, we increase the forest, but here a problem of forest management, because forest can be, uh, can be uh, at like, like it is. Is, it should be managed in order to uh, obtain results. Well, um, in, the, this, uh, in this framework, we have to uh, obtain some results, uh, for example, but lowering, uh, uh, as it was said, the pesticide by 50%, uh, lowering uh, the, the use of, of um, antibiotics in livestock activities by 50%. Uh, we have to reach 25% of organic uh, uh, area um, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so we have lots of challenges. 
Uh, and I think if we can combine these challenges with climate change, it's clear we need lots and lots of, in of innovation, otherwise it would be impossible. But we also have to take the consideration, we have very small farm in Europe, in Italy even more, even smaller. Um, for example, Emilia Romagna, which is above uh, average, but uh, we have uh, uh, 70 hectares uh, average uh, um, uh, farm. Uh, in Italy, I guess it's under uh, 15. Uh, in Germany, 30. Uh, but for example, in Emilia Romagna, we have 33,000 farms. Half of them were below five hectares. So this is the kind of farm we have around in Italy and Europe, and we cannot forget this. Otherwise, uh, we will take our wise policies. Uh, so uh, those small farmers cannot, cannot be let alone. They cannot stay outside of the, of the system, of the innovation system. So the only way to involve them is to cooperate. Cooperation is absolutely diffused in Italy. Uh, we have uh, in Emilia Romagna probably the most important cooperatives in the system, uh, but we also have uh, private producers' organizations. Uh, this is uh, absolutely important, and it's very important policies are focused on this kind of uh, aggregations because otherwise we leave uh, too many people outside of this uh, engagement, and we cannot do it. Uh, so I, I, I'm strongly in favor of the new CMO uh, policy, uh, which is uh, one of the three pillars of, uh, of the uh, common agricultural policy. Um, and of course, I'm in favor of all the activities, the new uh, challenges that uh, we have to face. Uh, sometimes farmers are uh, worried uh, and sometimes they also feel uh, in a way assaulted by these new rules. Uh, so one of the, of the things we, we, we should do is to uh, stay with them, listen to them, and uh, find solutions. Because uh, there, there is uh, any, uh, it's impossible to do an ecological transition without farmers. We, you should do uh, with them, not against them. Sometimes they feel that we are against them when, when they're doing this kind of, uh, uh, of considerations. Um, so uh, I think this is uh, one of the, of the main uh, work I'm doing in, in RF, where we are trying to spread innovation and make it affordable for all, and to clarify which is the, 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 which is the future. For example, during our last assembly, I had the honor to have with us Professor Valentini, which explained this new system uh, to, to put on trees in order to uh, find out how much carbon that tree is absorbing. So to do these calculations, at the end of the calculation, you can issue uh, the carbon certificate and you can sell them. This is completely new. Uh, so farmers don't know they should be they should have a, another income possibility. So we have to explain this. That there is not only the, the constraint of having to reduce pesticides, but there should be better economy uh, and that, that with sustainability uh, that becomes a new way of income. So uh, this is not no known by, 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 by farmers. They don't know it. So we have to spread the word, we have to, to spread the solutions, uh, and we have to put every farmer, even the small one, together with others in order to find uh, other solutions. One of the things we, we should support a lot, of course, is, is precision farming. Uh, I, can, uh, I could, uh, could do an uh, enormous amount of uh, examples, but uh, uh, for example, in, uh, in Emilia Romagna, we have some uh, uh, cooperatives in fruit and vegetable which are using uh, um, precision uh, irrigation. As you know, water management is another of the irrigation is uh, in place by already five years, I guess, uh, with every member uh, of the cooperative, even small farmers. Uh, they have their solution, they have the, the, the measurement, they have the system connected with the cooperative ones. So everyone can do his part. 
but any one of them without the cooperative should have done it. Uh, so cooperative producers organization, all the, all, all the value chain you can put into a contract or everything uh, are absolutely important. They, they would be paramount for, for reaching the result. Uh, and that's uh, one of the main points uh, I, I had to do this morning. Uh, then, and this is my last uh, contribution, uh, I hope uh, in, the, in the national strategic plan we have to do, and together with us, every, every country in Europe have to do a, a, a national strategic plan for agriculture, uh, I hope we will be sufficiently uh, ambitious. Uh, because uh, there's a, something really new. There was a big debate about the greenwashing of the CEP. I'm, I'm not particularly convinced that there's a greenwashing. There's something which is changing deeply uh, the, the habits of, uh, of farmers. Because, for example, in the first pillar, you, you used to receive some, uh, some public money just because you have some actors and you were doing your activity on them. Uh, yes, in the, in, in the, in the last um, program, uh, they put there the greening activity, but the greening wasn't effective. Uh, but today, they transform 25% of that comes only if you do an eco scheme. And eco schemes are quite demanding because uh, the, 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 the commission uh, published a, a list of eco scheme in January. I, I hope uh, we should be even more uh, productive here in Italy, for example, I'm working with some uh, people of Conapi and so on to, to find out an eco scheme of pollinators, because pollinators are really important, but uh, we should uh, uh, consider this will change habits, because I don't know any farmers can, can let 25% of, uh, of that money there. So they will be forced to change, and uh, they will need uh, a great assistance in innovation. We know uh, Europe this time has doubled the, the, the amount of Horizon uh, Europe money for agriculture from five to nine and, and so on, and something uh, billions. Uh, we have lots of money also on the uh, innovative operational group in the, in the CAP. Um, in Emilia Romagna, we need 200 of them. There are lots of, of solutions already into the uh, European Innovation Partnership. Uh, which is a common database, an open one. So all that open innovation should be used. And we, we should study all the solutions that have been found out in order to uh, save uh, water, uh, lower the use of pesticides, do uh, a livestock activity better. And uh, I hope today here, uh, we're discussing uh, uh, about energy, they will talk about also to, uh, of agro-energy because uh, I guess that the, the livestock activity, which is the one that we, is impacting in agriculture, uh, have the possibility to do a, a very important and virtuous uh, uh, circular um, activity by uh, producing biomethane. Uh, so we have to, of course, organize also the infrastructure for that, but we already have the technology we are as the people producing everything, so we have to put together the dots and uh, do it finally. I guess the, the, the new recovery fund would be uh, a great possibility for this in Italy, but also in Europe. Thank you so much. I think that... Uh, we are highlighting uh, the pain point because uh, around the ecological transition, we need to approach the cultural transition. You've been mentioning farmers uh, and the gap that we need to bridge uh, to let them understand uh, which are the, say, the dormant resources they already have available. So the carbon economy, the new carbon economy, and all the opportunities we can uh, face uh, with the implementation of circular economy as well, because now, finally, we're seeing that investing in sustainability is not something that we have to do because at the end of the year, we have uh, our corporate social responsibility yeah. report and we have to be nice. We are understanding that sustainability is a long-term investment that 
is part of the business strategies because if industry want to see their industry alive in the next 10 or 20 years there's no option to survive exactly <laughs> and then there are also the big industries that are finding uh, very successful um, tools and solutions to transform waste into something that uh, becomes a new product uh, a new value so I think that this is really probably the, the big pain point because we have the technology, science uh, is working hard and is giving us the numbers, the tools, the, the data from where we have to start. We have also startup innovators that are offering tons of solutions, but we need now to connect the bridge, to connect the dots and arrive to the farmers to make this transition happening at the pace that is needed. So thank you so much, Simona for bringing the farmers and the farming system perspective. And overall, I like also the opportunities we have as Italy, but also as Europe. Everyone needs to do thinking about the Mediterranean before, but now we have also another speaker that is going to bring uh, again a perspective that is going to highlight uh, what's the role of Mediterranean, how and why it's important to talk about energy, climate, environment in the Mediterranean, and again, which are the opportunities for the food systems uh, in the Mediterranean. So I would love to invite here President Angelo Riccaboni, the president of Prima Foundation. Buongiorno, Angelo. Buongiorno, good morning. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for this very interesting uh, uh, conference. And uh, you mentioned the, the Mediterranean, but uh, also I would like to uh, work on the previous words by Gramenos Mastroieni and uh, Riccardo Valentini. Gramenos very clearly as usual highlighted which are the challenges of the Mediterranean area. And I just say that uh, what he said, that this area, in this area, the climate, the, the temperature is uh, increasing 20% faster than in any other part of the world. That is enough. Okay. I shouldn't add anything to that. So we have many challenges in front of us. And uh, I think that in the spirit of this uh, initiative, I would like to highlight the need for a nexus approach. Nexus means putting together water, energy, food, and ecosystem resources. So we need to work in a systemic way. I think it's one of the major messages coming from the G20 that we need to work not by silos, but look at these topics as they are strongly connected among themselves. So this is what we should do. So somebody should say, and what do you do to do that? Correct. So what do we do as Prima? Prima is, uh, first of all, what is Prima? Prima is the most ambitious scientific diplomacy initiative ever launched in the Mediterranean with a, a budget of a half a billion euros, uh, put by half by the uh, European Commission and half by 19 Euro Mediterranean countries. And Italy plays a key role and uh, the Ministry of uh, University of Research is the most important actor in this initiative. And uh, I greet uh, Luigi Nicolais because, and I thank him and the ministry for the strong effort put in this initiative. And every year, we, we as foundation implementing a, a strategic research innovation agenda, which is uh, seven year long. And every year we launch calls for 70 million euros on four topics. One is uh, efficient use of water, one is uh, sustainable farming, one is food value chains, and one is uh, welfare. Water, energy, food, ecosystem, resources, nexus. And this last issue for us is becoming more and more important because what we see every day is that water, food, energy, our so related that we need to have a systemic perspective, which is very difficult in Prima and is 
even difficult. We as scientists too often are really vertical. We are we we think by silos. We shouldn't do that. So it is even difficult to find uh, researchers and entrepreneurs who would like to in a systemic way. So in order to promote it, we have already launched, I said, five calls. We have also recently launched in a, a prize, an award for researchers and uh, for practitioners to award good practices. So we, I think it was uh, over right, right a few days ago, the, the call for these awards. And on top of it, at the end of September, so I take this opportunity to promote it, at the end of September, we will have a major Mediterranean initiative organized by the European Commission, GRC, UFM. We are very proud of the partnership with the UFM, the Cyprus Institute, and Prima. We will have a, a major initiative in Cyprus, in Nicosia, to work on these issues, the issue of nexus, which we think is, is really crucial. And uh, what we would like to see is how to make science not only as a driver of innovation, which is very important, but the role of science as interface with the policymaking process. I mean, the key issue now is how to bring science in the policymaking process. I mean, this is the, the key issue. And uh, we know all that it's very difficult, but unfortunately, COVID showed that we need to bring science within the policymaking process. So uh, we know it is difficult because uh, politics and policies speak a different language from scientists and researchers, but we need to work in that direction. Maybe also conferences like these are helping in this direction, but this is a key issue. So key issues are two. One is how to bring science concepts and, and like the nexus concept within the policymaking process. And the other major issue is how to bring the results of research innovation to our communities and our enterprises. So a clear uptake by them. Because we should stop saying that we should do something. We should do it, not just say that we should do something. We should do it. So this is the key uh, task in front of us. Uh, I like, I mean, illuminating uh, speeches. I like uh, uh, data, but now, I mean, every day we see on TV that we are really on crisis and we need to do concrete actions. So this is the reason why these two points to bring science within the policymaking process and to facilitate the uptake of innovation by enterprise and, uh, and, uh, and uh, communities is crucial. It means that I should stop here. No, no. Uh, but only a few words more to say that uh, for those interested in Prima, we are very proud that uh, so far we have already funded 129 projects. This is the booklet. And uh, I give as a gift to Sarah. Thank so you. She, she has uh, some document on top of it. I'm available to, 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 to illustrate Prima to all of you if, if you like later. And uh, 129 projects. And uh, uh, I'm saying that just to connect with the previous presentation. Maybe also you said that it's so important partnership. So if you want to tackle the challenges that uh, Gramenos and Ricardo highlighted, we need to work together. We need to work together. I mean, we need we need to bridge to to, to build bridges, not walls. And Prima is a major bridge. I mean, we want to work together in line with the SDGs number seventeen, and. Uh, uh, just to give you an example, of a concrete example, in our calls, there is a rule which says that you need to have, a, among the candidates, also units from the south of the Mediterranean. So we have funded, as I said, 160, uh, 129 projects. We have 1,183 units working together. Every year we have 400 more. So in a few years we will have more than 2,000 units and 30% of the money and 30% of units come from the south. So I always say that we need uh, 10 primas, a different Mediterranean scenario. I know it is impossible, but never say but because there are some 
things which are changing. Europe has uh, understood that we need to do more in Africa. UFM is playing a key role, a great role to promote partnerships. And also Prima is part of this conversation to be more active as a Europe in Africa. The future of the century is Africa, as everybody knows. So we need to be more able to work with African uh, partners and Prima is giving its contribution in the future. We hope to give even a greater contribution, especially if, as it is happening, the Italian government and Moore is with us. Thank you very much, Sarah. And what you are saying is connecting us to the world of startup innovators, because actually Prima is very, very active also connecting all the ecosystems of innovators within the Mediterranean area. I think that the projects that are coming out are showing that uh, this is the only way we have to, to see the future. And is, uh, I, see, I think it's, the, it's a, a blessing uh, to have the opportunity to connect organizations like Prima, like the Union for Mediterranean, like uh, all the organizations that now are here, are here sh sharing <laughs> that they are available to support the broader ecosystem of science and innovation uh, to make this uh, thing happen fast, 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 fast. And the, the numbers that they were showing yesterday are, are telling us that we don't have time. When you hear we don't have time and you think about agriculture, you think that you need to follow some rhythm, or the rhythm of the nature, because when we think about uh, the decade of action or 2030, we have to have clear in mind that we have eight agricultural season ahead. So the agriculture is setting the pace of the transition sometimes. So in food is even more difficult because there are things that we cannot speed up just because we want. So we have also to wait for the rhythm of the nature. And so this is actually probably one of the most challenging things because uh, we need to deal with what the earth is answering and how the earth is reacting to our innovations. Thank you so much, Professor Thank you very much. And I want to connect the breakups and innovations. And we wanted to have with us within this, uh, this panel, Daniel Gold. Daniel Gold is a great friend of the Future Food Institute, but overall, she's at the global level, probably one of the most renowned thought leaders in the food tech scene. Danielle started 10 years ago, the Food Tech Connect. It is the most important platform in the world related to food and tech. And we wanted to have her voice here when we're talking about science, because what we have been seeing in these years is that actually innovation in food and tech are rooted in science. And what she's seeing now within the food system is that the transition towards the regenerative approach, the transition towards more science-based innovations is actually the, the major trend within the global food tech ecosystem. So thank you so much for being here, for joining us in Italy for this uh, event and we want to hear, hear from your voice what you see from the global perspective because your platform is global and you really are touching uh, all the pain points on one side see world because we haven't spoken enough about that Simona Caselli was mentioning a little bit the topic, but behind the transition, we need to support all the transition with finance, with finance, because we need to understand how we support also farmers and small startup to make this great innovation come to life. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It's so nice to be here with all of you. Uh, so, as Sarah said, I have a community of food innovators. We have over 47,000 innovators in 32 countries around the world. And what we've seen over the last 10 years has been unprecedented investment. There are tens of billions of dollars that are being invested annually into food startups. Um, and then if you connect that with the investments of the large agri-food businesses, whether it's FMTG companies, whether it's um, agribusiness, 
you know, uh, there are billions of dollars that are being invested right now to create a more sustainable food system. And I couldn't agree more with many of the comments that were already made today about the importance of bridging policy, science, and the innovation side we start up. So where we're seeing the is in the plant-based sector and in the biotechnology sector. Means that are going on strategies, but they're not. We really need to start understanding where should the investments be made. How do we start to measure? How do we start to have guidance so that it's not just that you're saying, okay, we have Beyond Meat, for example, which is the one of the largest plant-based companies in the world. Um, globally. And they are being lionized as a company that is helping to save our planet by reducing meat consumption. And yet, they're using peas that are grown in monocultures. And, and a lot of the companies that are in this space that are developing technologies are saying that they're reducing meat consumption, yet it's not the whole picture, right? So if you think about Peas, for example, peas could be grown as a rotational crop that could help to build up soil organic matter, build biodiversity, sequester carbon, build up water, but that's not how it's being grown. So that's one consideration. And I think it's very critical for us to start thinking very strategically from a policy perspective and also from a scientific perspective in, as far as how are we incentivizing holistic innovation and not just so that we can tick a box that says we're reducing meat consumption. The other area that, that I would urge people to think about is on the biotechnology side. So because of food security, you have um, governments around the world that are starting to make serious investments in a lot of these technologies, right? And we see with Singapore, for example, with Singapore um, 2030, where the Singaporean government has committed to um, producing 30% of its food for, by 2030 for food security purposes. And so they are making huge investments into the biotechnology space, right? And, and so you see that Eat Just and other companies, they're the first company to go to market with a, a, um, a biotechnology uh, chicken. Right, that you're able to, and and soon. I mean, there are some predictions that Europe will, the EU will be fast following that. And so there are a lot of considerations for us to think about when we think about biotechnology, the next revolution of biotechnology in our food. Right, there's the ethics, there's the energy consumption, there's the waste streams, and what I urge everyone to think about is there are a lot of venture dollars. They're going into this. This is the this is the next space race, right? This is where people think this is how we're going to save the planet. And so we have to be thinking and and thinking very critically about the ethics, the policy to ensure that we, from a sustainability perspective, we are um, we we're but also that are ethical, that are not concentrating intellectual property in the hands of a couple of companies, right? That are that are not um, creating disadvantages for the communities in which these uh, technologies are being, where, where the manufacturing is taking place. Um, so I think that that's really critical. And the other area that I'm really focused on right now is, is you know, there's this movement of around regenerative agriculture a study we worked with um, Beef of Lamb New Zealand and New Zealand Wine. We did a, um, a half year study on the state of regenerative agriculture in the US, the UK, and Germany. And then we also did a consumer insight study that understand consumer perception. So without a doubt, and you know, even being in here in Italy to see the growth of regenerative agriculture, 
and you see from a farm perspective, from an ecosystem services, as has already been mentioned, the birth of carbon marketplaces, you know, we see with the CAP um, in the US, the Biden administration is making huge investments right now in carbon farming and carbon banking. So this is certainly going to grow. But I think that it's very easy for us to think about the science and the innovation and not holistically about the business model. And if we and the financing. And so what I urge everyone to consider and think about is when we think about regenerative systems, we have to think holistically and we need to be building regenerative business models and regenerative regenerative financial systems that more equitably distribute value across all stakeholders, that include all stakeholders, that include the farmers, not that we're coming and giving telling them how they should farm but that they are actually a part of designing what the systems are because they know what they need to be growing. You know, they know what is best in order to support their soil, in order to draw down carbon, in order to support their communities. And while in Italy, you have these very robust small farming communities and a, and a, a very, a very a, a culture that is very attached and very close to farming, in most of the rest of the world, you don't have that. Or in the Western world, you don't have that, even within the EU and especially within the US. Um, so where, where I think that there's a lot of opportunity, as I said earlier, is to bridge the venture back innovation that's happening. It's critical that there is connections between the science um, and policy. And then for us also to think about, we can't regenerate using degenerative financial models. And so we have to rethink that. And um, I'm very excited. We're going to explore with Sarah some opportunities. Next year, we're going to launch uh, a, a year-long investigation called Planet Positive Food and Agriculture. It's going to be a series that's going to happen online. We'll also have a community where we can bring together all of the stakeholders to investigate what are the best policies, the best practices from a business perspective, um, perspective, the science to, to really have an impact across every part of the value chain. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Danielle. Overall, because you have been mentioning also some of the most critical scenarios that we see. You have been mentioning about uh, the issue of proteins, the future of proteins. You have been talking about uh, technology, how technology can uh, really support the uh, agricultural transition. And if we talk about those issues, uh, sometimes uh, at least coming from our nation, our world, we see the risk uh, because uh, has been announced we see the risk of uh, this global diet uh, that can be imposed uh, just because of uh, climate issue and environmental issue. But I love what you were saying because you underline the need of having an holistic perspective uh, and that we, we love to call the integral ecology approach, where actually when we talk about ecology, we should have a very holistic approach, thinking about uh, the economical aspect, the political aspect, the cultural aspect, the human and the social aspect, and the environmental aspect uh, all together. Because, and let's say, we're talking from the region that is hosting one of the emblematic communities of Mediterranean diet, for example. UNESCO underline that Mediterranean diet is probably one of the most sustainable one, but it's been uh, nominee as one of the world heritage, not only because of the eating habits, uh, of the set of values, the set of practices, the cultural aspect, uh, and many, many, many other values that are a combination that are making uh, this asset uh, as an intangible world heritage. And so this is the crucial part. Science, uh, the approach, uh, the technology, the digital uh, acceleration, let's say, but also keeping in mind the cultural framework uh, where we are adopting those technologies. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And now I want to involve uh, Matteo Vignoli, from the University of Bologna here with me, co-founder of the Future Food Institute. I'm going to leave you my...
talk. And we're gonna jump into the second part of our journey. And now we've been talking about food for her. We have been talking about the nexus between food and the society. Understanding also the perspective of Europe and understanding the perspective of the Mediterranean area where we are, because we are really in the heart of the Mediterranean. And now we're gonna talk about the food and science. Please, Matteo, I leave you my mic. Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, um, to keep the, the time, I'll, I'll be very, very uh, um, brief because uh, the, the most critical um, takeaway from the previous session that I want to um, bring in the next one is that I am a living example that science cannot save the world alone. As a uh, few years ago, when uh, um, we met, uh, myself and Sarah were part of two different and uh, uh, sometimes uh, this uh, disgregated ecosystem. I was part of the university and she was part of the uh, um, entrepreneurial world. And uh, I have to admit, when uh, I was you know, thinking how to change the world with food, people were telling me, yeah, you should talk with Sarah. And I was like uh, intellectually, uh, thinking, what can I do with uh, a food entrepreneur? It's like, uh, I'm coming from the university, what can we do together? And uh, uh, the meeting that we had uh, led to future food. So we actually could do something together. We could, uh, you know, bridge two different worlds and perspective to make concrete actions. And, you know, Angel was mentioned that happening. So with this invite, uh, I would like to uh, call on stage uh, Professor Luigi Nicolais, which is the coordinator of the Scientific Technical Committee of Fondazione di Sicilia della Scienza and many other things. Uh, but uh, um, he's going to present us um, the role of research and what can research do to bridge the gaps to business, to, uh, you know, um, entities and organizations around the world that can really make change into our society. Professor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you also for the very nice and very up-to-date subject to this meeting. We are really touching the many points that are of big interest for the future of Europe and for the future of the world. First, first thing I want to say, I was very pleased to be sitting uh, here in the previous uh, panel. And uh, I found that there were many, many common points. Uh, and one of these was cooperation. Uh, Graham Menos Mastroianni was saying uh, cooperative economy. And then Simona Caselli, farm cooperation. And then uh, Angelo Riccaboni, we need to work together. That's, I think, is a key point. We have to learn that there's nothing that we can do by ourselves. We cannot do anything alone. you can be a right professor, very good professor. But if you don't, you can write a beautiful of uh, your country, of the development of, of the, the general uh, global world. That's, that's, I think, uh, that's the point. Now, we have finally put attention to environment, energy consumption, and the food for it. Finally, I say, because we should really be done this many years ago. Because the point is that we are in a position where if we don't do everything together, this attention, we don't put all together this attention, Europe by itself is a so small country compared to, to the rest of the world. Uh, we can do all our effort, but if Chinese, uh, United States, but other countries, they don't take care of the environment, it's uh, almost useless. We should do what we have to do, but we also should be very, very care that, uh, uh, very careful that everyone does what he has to do. 
uh, what we need now that uh, we need in, uh, in the production, we, we need to redesign the processes. You know, all processes have been designed with uh, some boundary condition. One of these was economy, was uh, productivity. And so you design a process uh, taking into account that your process should be more productive than another competitive uh, uh, process that is uh, you already used. And these are, now we have to put some other words inside. We, we need other, other key points, other, other boundary condition. And one of these is environment. Then we um, <clears throat> need to put more attention to the use of our product. So circular economy is a must, is not any anymore an option. When someone designs something with a given material, should design starting from the cradle to the tomb. So she should know what is going to happen once that kind of object is not anymore used. So anything should be redesigned, taking into account what is the keywords and what are the most important parameters that we have to take into account now. Then we really we have to be, be really aware that the digitalization is not anymore an option, is a must. We have to understand that the technology of the paper and pain is over, is not our technology but the, our technology is digital. That is an important issue because this is not a problem of technology because the technology, the technology is already present. There is a problem of a social attitude. It's a, it's a problem of the people that have to understand that they cannot just keep their data, but they have to put the data in, in common with others. And this is, about, this is true mainly for the public administration, because the public administration is not able to just undergo to this big transition just because people are not interested in just putting in common a work together in the, uh, with the same data. That's, that's a, a big point. So, <clears throat> uh, this Uh, now, for that, we, we need to uh, uh, are, are start with the Italian blue that uh, was just putting money for uh, blue sky research, for basic research, for fundamental research. I think we need to produce knowledge. That's, that's really a key issue. We need to produce knowledge just uh, without any kind of uh, a possible application in the beginning. But we also need to try to bring this, uh, this knowledge to business. That's the reason why we started with this government to just uh, putting a rather important amount of money for, for basic research. And then when we wrote our we put down from research to business in order to say you need to produce about when you one of the last you can use the knowledge that you have there. That's a, an Italian problem. The, the number of, and uh, with uh, Canada are the highest, the biggest producer of knowledge compared with, of course, uh, normalized with the number of researchers uh, with the amount of money that are uh, put in the, in the expenses. But if you go to see how many people have used the knowledge, you see that we are very low, very low in, in the score. That's the reason why we have to learn that the, the figure of researcher and the figure of uh, innovator are different. The researcher is the one who is able to produce knowledge. The innovator has to understand the research, but has different objective. That is to bring this research into the market in just the diffusion knowledge, 
but uh, as she said, she said, as, so in order to let all the people understand the, the research, because very often one the researcher speaks, speaks a different language than the, the normal people could, could understand. So you need this other kind of person that are very important for the diffusing the knowledge to let them understand what is the meaning that is the difference between a virus and, uh, and not be a very important professor to explain that because for him is obvious that there's a difference so i i think that's uh, that's the way we are moving this meeting is important because when we speak about food when we speak about any other kind of um, uh, of point that we will discuss it like environment we need to understand that the, in the in the in the APA NRR, Italy uh, and many people in Italy were just uh, uh, interested on in how much money are coming, and so this uh, 200 almost 200 billions of euros. That's beautiful, but what they will do with PNRR is a change of mental mentality. We have to change our bureaucratic system. We need to be faster. We need to be faster in making a judgment. We need to be faster in developing new activities. We have to be faster in just translate the knowledge in application. That's what uh, PNRR is, uh, is uh, really asking to us. And uh, I think it's a, it's a beautiful time for young people at this moment. Surely the pandemic has been terrible, but I think in this moment we are changing everything. We have to be ready to something to which we are not used. And when you innovate, you in front of you, there is something that is unknown, also for the market. But surely you try to stay in your own field because you, you feel safe, but that's not the moment. We have to change, we have to change everything. And really, I hope in this meeting that we are having today, all, all the 20 important people that are there will understand that the real point is, is not to be just stick to, to the privilege that we have, but to open to the needs that we have to, to look about and to try to forget the past use the past as history, like we'll look forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nicolais. Thank you. I, um, <laughs> no, I want to just uh, mention one thing which is really crucial. We have uh, our uh, research ecosystem. So it's very easy as uh, uh, Prima Foundation was uh, reminding us to, uh, you know, find cooperation among universities. Like uh, just uh, uh, most of, call of my colleagues are just one phone call away. But uh, how many entrepreneurs are one call away from scientists? And how many scientists are one call away from entrepreneurs? This is something that research should take into account because we need to form this innovation system, which is not present yet in our world. And why we do that? We do that because we need to be faster to have this kind of transition that uh, um, links research and uh, entrepreneurs. Now I want to ask uh, Dr. Marta Antonelli, uh, she should be online. Um, Thank you, Mark, and welcome. And pretty much, she had the research of, at the BC event. So she's one of the researchers that uh, she proved to be connected between academia and um, society. Uh, and she will, um, you know, uh, present us uh, how food uh, um, consumption can link, uh, uh, you know, uh, resources uh, and climate change. Mark. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this important event. I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, here with you. 
So um, today we discuss different aspects of uh, food system, which today are at a cross crossroad that requires immediate action. And uh, in this context, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, uh, the role of the G20 countries uh, in this process of transformation that we need to accelerate. The G20 countries represent, in fact, about 60% of the global population, 80% of its economic output, uh, and uh, something like 75% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions at the global level. So I would like to, uh, to uh, point out that they have the uh, power, the influence, and also the responsibility to address uh, uh, the challenges of uh, food systems uh, today. Um, so the, 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 the new FAO report uh, on food security and nutrition highlighted that uh, we are still very far from uh, uh, achieving the SDG 2, meaning uh, ending hunger, uh, addressing food insecurity and all forms uh, of malnutrition by the year 2030. And this uh, picture, this global picture has been further exacerbated by COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so, uh, and it's also going to get worse uh, um, uh, unless uh, we, we tackle all these distortions that uh, include uh, interventions uh, in the production, processing, distribution, and also the consumption of food. So changing uh, food consumption is part of the change we need to make very fast. Uh, this is due to the contribution uh, that food system make, for example, to uh, the release of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so up to 37% according to the IPCC. And this include uh, uh, the, the, the different phases of food systems. So from, far, from farm to fork uh, to disposal of the huge amount of uh, food waste uh, uh, that uh, we still produce uh, at the individual level. Um, so through a healthier and sustainable diet, uh, we can reverse uh, the global syndemic of uh, climate change and malnutrition, but also act uh, uh, upon uh, another uh, huge challenge that uh, we face at the global level, that is water, uh, water scarcity. Um, so despite at the global level, we currently uh, withdraw about 10% of the total renewable water resources that are available on the planet. We have severe water scarcity in many places of the world. So uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's noteworthy, I think, to mention that two thirds uh, of the global population already experience intra-annual water scarcity which results, of course, uh, in uh, inefficient, uh, insufficient water availability to meet water demands uh, in water scarce regions. And this is, for example, the, the, the driver of uh, the dependency on food imports, uh, something that is, has been referred to as virtual water trade, for instance. And just to put it in context, uh, about 180 countries in the world uh, are net virtual water exporters uh, with scarcity playing uh, a big role in, in this. Um, so climate change, population growth, urbanization, but uh, above all change in the food preferences as a, a result of the nutrition transition are big drivers uh, of, uh, uh, of water, of incre increasing water demands uh, and of imbalances between shrinking supply and uh, uh, increasing pressure. So at the individual level, we uh, use up to 6,000 uh, liters of water per day to satisfy our agricultural, industrial, and domestic uh, goods. Um, uh, and uh, and th 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 this amount of water, which uh, is huge, in fact, uh, has been referred to virtual water. That is the water that has been embedded in every phase uh, of uh, production. So something that uh, includes, for example, not only direct uh, water use, but also indirect uh, water use, meaning, for instance, not only the water that you provide to uh, uh, raise livestock, but also the water that has been uh, needed to uh, produce the crops uh, that are used uh, by uh, to, to feed uh, livestock. So uh, this is to say that over 90% of uh, uh, the water footprint uh, uh, that we have at the individual level is uh, uh, related to food. And this includes not only fresh water, but also rainwater, a resource uh, that underpins global food security, uh, whose productivity uh, is still below potential in many parts of, uh, of the world. 
So uh, I will conclude by saying that it is clear that we need to move towards more sustainable approaches to uh, food consumption uh, besides intervention on, uh, on, on production. But this is not entirely up to individual motivation or willingness because it requires political action and it requires action that enables individual to make this, uh, uh, this more sustainable uh, choices. So uh, I would conclude by just suggesting a few priority areas that I believe are important to achieve this change. So firstly, create uh, and increasing uh, enabling food environments uh, that uh, uh, in, uh, in, in other words, uh, uh, can help uh, individuals uh, uh, to choose sustainable food uh, in an easy way as the default option. Um, secondly, invest uh, uh, in food education in school uh, since early age until postgraduate level. This is fundamental. Thirdly, promote uh, uh, more actively sustainable, healthy and traditional diets such as the Mediterranean diet. This is one of the most precious heritage that we have in the Mediterranean countries and in Italy as well. And uh, we, we, we really need to emphasize uh, that uh, by adopting, uh, by re-adopting these, uh, these diets, uh, uh, we can not only uh, live uh, a healthy and uh, longer, but also release our pressure on the environment. Uh, last but not least, uh, I think it's important to um, establish food-based dietary guidelines that explicitly connect uh, food, uh, health, uh, and uh, the environment. Um, and we know uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, th th these guidelines uh, drive, for example, public procurement and uh, uh, so many other activities at, uh, at the national level. Um, just to uh, give one data, only two countries uh, in the European Union uh, explicitly, explicitly uh, do that. Um, so I will end up here and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your words. I want to uh, build on one of the priorities, which is education. And um, uh, investing in food education is something that uh, we at Future Food believe uh, uh, since the beginning. And we also think that it should not only be done at, you know, at uh, you know, elementary school or uh, when it's already been implemented, but should also be uh, brought beyond. When uh, we um, encounter uh, scientists and PhD uh, students in our uh, uh, boot camp, and we encountered many of them in, in, the, in, the, in the years, uh, they said it was the first time that somebody studying agriculture was uh, together with a lawyer uh, in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a boot camp. And, uh, and we know how it's important that uh, policymakers and scientists speak together, but in all their course of study, like 25 to 30 years, never happened. So we should rethink in the G20 how this kind of education takes place. Otherwise, we can ask people when they are 40 age to work with others, but they never done so. They've been evaluated for all their life in doing something specific. And now we ask them to cross bridges and that doesn't happen. So uh, somebody that um, uh, crossed bridges and uh, was able to build this kind of, uh, you know, thinking uh, is uh, Alfonso Petraro Scagno, which I kindly invite uh, here on stage. He is the president of the General Council of Univerde Foundation and uh, you know, ex Ministry of Agriculture and many other exes. But uh, we are also we are more than them interested in the future, not the ex. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. Particularly. And congratulations, because it was very difficult to organize something in the period of G20 uh, in a beautiful city like Naples, as I know very well, because I was for many times member of parliament elect in this city. And uh, uh, I was Minister of Agriculture, and uh, after that I was also Minister of Environment when uh, Gino Nicolais was my colleague as Minister of Innovation. So I have uh, contact with a very important scientific sector, also in, this, 
in the Council of Ministers, because he was both first scientist and after also a little, a little bit politician. I, I, I was more involved in it. And also because my history is I was a lawyer, now I teach in the University of Sustainable Tourism in Milan, Rome, and Naples. So I still work always on sustainability. Also, when I founded the Italian Green Movement 30 years ago, at that time, uh, green was strange. It's green. What is renewable energy? What is organic agriculture? Now the problem is the opposite. Everyone speaks about green, but very few situations do really green. That's the problem. It's also a problem of G20. Now, every time we make statement and say, we have to stop fossil uh, 2020, 2050, 2040, maybe they can sign also tomorrow. The problem is that if a thing makes some real action, or oh, it's also a lot of very good ideas, but not real action. Now the problem is to do, not to speak about green. Because uh, I, I, I was in May, I, I, I did the COP uh, of uh, climate change convention. And if I read all the things that we decide last uh, years, I'm very scared because uh, uh, we decided we have no we, we have to stop the emission below 400 part for million uh, of CO2. And now we are 420 and 30 and uh, we are going uh, every time every time ahead. So we need absolutely to make a real monitoring of what happens after we decide some things. Otherwise, uh, we accept uh, climate change that can be can can become disaster because now the problem is that the climate change exists. This is the first exist. If tomorrow we stop to use gas, fuel, and cook, for next twenty years we have a climate change important. Maybe we can avoid a disaster, the catastrophe. But now we need first work on how to reduce the problem with climate change. Every one of you uh, watch at what happened in Germany, not a, a small country, Germany. And Germany is, is different from Italy. They are generally very organized, but they didn't make a good prediction and they didn't do some work to reduce the problem of floating, even if our years and years that all the scientific sector, that's why we say, what the scientific? They say, you risk the extinction of uh, homo sapiens. And, oh, okay, just extinction. They say, we risk the it is really incredible the difference between the very heavy alarm on this side and the very soft. In uh, schools uh, with guys that have 18, 20, and when it is normal because they don't want extinct ourselves because the people of 20 years or 15 years 20 years theoretically according to what the ipcc said in uh, united nations scientific committee it's not our or people that speak in a bar or in a, or in a pub and they say we have the risk at the end of this year that means in 60 uh, 60 70 80 years i mean that means that a person 20 years now, when be 80, maybe can watch the extinction. I mean, it is uh, an is is important thing or it's not? 
So the problem now is to work exactly according to what the scientific sector said. And uh, we need absolutely some very important changing, not climate changing, a society changing. Because a society includes also the economic sector, the financial sector, everyone. And now the financial sector and the economic sector is even more concerned than the political ones. Because the politics watch at the next election, that is generally every year, more or less. Because one year election in Germany, one year region election, one year it's another election. So it's every year is on election. So the politics watch in one year, two years. For luckily, the big uh, fund, uh, the big financial sector, they need uh, a program for 20, 30 years. And so I joking said that the extinction of the consumers or the extinction of the, the owners of this, uh, maybe it's a problem also for economic and financial sector. So the extinction, maybe it's why I, I need a program of 30 years, 40 years, uh, and uh, maybe the extinction is, is a problem. You know? We need to do something. And so now some situations are stopping because of the financial decision, because nobody may put money or private money to open a Coke new central. Because they, in the prediction, that are, so we need now to use this moment because there are a lot of money, not only the recovery fund money. There are much more money that are uh, out from the fossil sector and they are looking to make investment in real renewable energy sector. I'm speaking about crime. I don't want, I don't want to exclude the food moment, but there is no food if we don't solve the problem of the... <laughs> if you are extincted, we don't need the food. And so the problem now is do a big job to use all our uh, energy of uh, NGOs, because this is the side of it, and I appreciate very much the NGO activity, because the official one is now a statement, generica, we are against the climate change. Yes, we are for renewable, perfect. And yesterday, our minister of uh, trans energetic transition said, okay, we need still to make some perforazioni petrolifere, I don't know in English, right? Some uh, trivellazioni? Oil, oil extraction. Oil is in Italian. And we need the transition and we decide to do other research for fossil. Uh, what, 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 what is the uh, logic? I wait to, I waited a government that say we need some really important wind central in the sea because people are afraid the on the on the hill Italy is a very good country of landscape and so we have to reduce the impact on the landscape but in the sea we need to do the wind sector at at the minimum in the sea we have to do on all the roof of this country. Yesterday I was with the mayor of Rome to the presentation of the plan of Rome that is the cover also of all the roof of our capital of the photovoltaic. But this is the idea, the project that we need after how we arrive to this project if we don't do every month something. We don't arrive to the target. And so we need this. Uh, other side, the food. Of course, the food is uh, incredibly important on this uh, sector. Uh, you know that in Rome, next week, the open the press summit of FAO and on, on the sustainable agriculture systems before the summit in September in New York. 
and also I heard the speakers before that speak about Mediterranean diet. And this is another big moment because one side we have to uh, arrive to an agriculture that is uh, uh, connected with the real sustainability. And that means a lot of things, you know, everywhere very well. The other side is the strange idea of a part of the United Nations to speak about a global diet that is a multinational uh, dream, but is not the dream of the people. That idea to have a global diet of uh, like artificial one pill for proteins, one pill for vitamins, one pill, this is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, and never happen. That's the situation. It's always a situation of maybe some global uh, foundation that put money on the idea of we have only one kind of agriculture for all the world, only one kind of food, of tradition, of food for all the world that is not a real world, is an absolute situation. So Italy for sure in the international, uh, international institution said absolutely not. We are not agreeing with this statement. We want to promote the Mediterranean diet and the, all the diet that comes from the tradition of the peoples. And we don't need to make a confusion. The confusion, what is the confusion? Because, for example, the Bill Gates Foundation, just to say foundation, they live in the States. In the States, they have a system totally based on meat. And it is a meat with organs that in Europe is forbidden. And this tradition with the chicken, you can have a very incredible kind of uh, situation because the chicken is also in the dirty situation. After you, you say, but you, you clean in a chemical way the, 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 the chicken and after it's a good. Our, our tradition is the control of the process of agriculture, not only on the product. We, we need to have a control of all the change that is And particularly, we don't need a diet totally meat oriented. On the diet, totally meat oriented more practically, for example, the cheese. And in the Mediterranean diet, you have minimum part of meat, minimum part. And after, the big majority is, of course, fruit and vegetables, and is internationally recognizable as a good diet, but it's not the only one. Because in India they have a diet mainly based on this in other countries. Because only in the state the situation the big one dollar. Of course, in Hamburg for one dollar it is not possible that it's not junky. Must be junk food. We need to promote the and the local diets of the world. Of course, it's big impact on the climate change. We can do this. Yes. We need to do this. Yes. And if we stay in a place that is food for Good food for health is good food. Also, the planet don't need to be defended by us because the planet lives also without human beings. Every time we say we defend the planet, no, we defend ourselves. 
we try to defend Homo sapiens. And I hope also a lot of other animals that risk to be extinct with us. So the food for health must be a good a food that reduces the impact of climate change, give to the people also the amusement and the play the plaisir of food. Because in the Mediterranean diet is not only what you eat, but how you eat. It's a convenience that is the style. And we need a good activity for all the people that need good agriculture. We don't need GMO. The, the agriculture, I mean, the, the scientific culture is okay, but it's okay is in the, the way that the nature gives us the prospect. Because otherwise we destroy the familiar agriculture, family agriculture, that is the big objective also of this meeting of United Nations. We need to help to stay on the ground and also renewable energy. We need renewable energy, but not destroying the solar on the but mainly the panel must be on the roofs, not on the ground. This is our job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Um, you see, like the energy and also, um, you know, the challenge that we have ahead. One of that is agriculture, and we are going to speak about that with Federica Rossi. Uh, Hello. Can you hear me? Or can you see me? Yeah. Hello? Good morning. Uh, I try to share screen. my screen if possible. Yes. Federica is going to introduce us uh, a step change in agriculture, um, a joint approach, because uh, to achieve what um, Apostle Cabral's Canyon was reminding us, we need. Uh, joint initiative between farmers and institutions, between farmers and scientists. Okay. Uh, sorry, I don't know because the line is you quite disturbed. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay, may okay. I go ahead? Okay, but we cannot see your screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I thank you for the invitation, not just as a researcher of CNR, the Institute of Bioeconomy, but mostly on behalf of the Academia of the Geographie that I represent here with pleasure and I thank you for the opportunity to bring a voice in this uh, uh, today strategic uh, uh, occasion. Uh, you know, academias are the communities of people that, uh, uh, okay, Okay, thank you, I see the screen now. Um, people connected with the thinking and studying, and in specific, the word uh, geographically uh, comes from the ancient Greek and means, uh, as you all know, uh, friends of agriculture. So it's from uh, 17, um, 1753, that are uh, almost uh, uh, 270 years that this academia promotes uh, the progress of knowledge, the transfer of innovation in food production, uh, the environmental connection between farmers and agriculture, and the social growth and the well being. So, we really feel extremely strategic uh, today to be here at this meet meeting, uh, mostly when we consider how crucial is the creation of a, a community that is committed, as was said before that is able to work together for more sustainable and equitable food, uh, food production, not just here, but the entire planet. So to push what uh, uh, Ricardo said before, that the metamorphosis uh, we were talking before. Uh, I'm going to the next slide, so I don't know, uh, because I don't see the screen, but uh, 
as imagined in this conversation, uh, what we really need uh, is a step change to, to address our production system to a new form of agriculture that is, uh, uh, that of course incorporates all the technology that we have. We said that uh, Professor Nicolai's uh, point the, the finger on that. We have a lot of technological innovation, of course, the agriculture 4.0 approach, the use of uh, uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence, IoT, big data, precision farming. Um, but we have to use that to be able to interpret it and then bring it to the to the real world, and also recover and it restores uh, some of what has been uh, progressively lost, some um, more traditional practices that have low impact. So uh, all of these, of course, uh, considering the pressure of climate change and climate variability. So the need of optimize and the need to optimize the use of resources that are limited, as we know. So what are the main pillars of uh, what is called the climate smart agriculture approach? First, uh, as you can see, sustainable increase of production, of productivity and uh, sustainability means also sustainability of income for farmers not just for farmers, but also for the community of factors that are involved in the value chain. Uh, with a concomitant and better generalized uh, um, use of resources. Uh, we can also, we can still stay on the second slide, please. Um, okay, thank you. Um, the second pillar is to adapt to climate pressure and become resilient. Um, minimizing the impact due to climate change. And third, to be able to mitigate. Mitigate means to reduce emission of, or to increase the uptakes of greenhouse gases uh, from crop and animal breed. Um, how this can be done and what we can do together to identify is to identify and put on place or put an operational, uh, a sustainable food, food production way through um, finding and adopting a, a climate resilient pathway and by increasing the effectiveness of local institution and fostering a coherence between climate, agriculture and environmental policies. And as was said before, uh, uh, link climate and finance. Uh, okay, the next please. Um, as you may say, see here, the process is necessarily a multi-actor approach in which uh, the actors come from uh, farmers, uh, the first to be directly interested. As Simona Caselli said before, they have to be informed, to be driven, because often they do not know. Two technology providers that are uh, industries, uh, chemical, mechanical, packaging, just to mention some. To, let, to the last extreme of the chain, so the citizen and consumer and markets that uh, we should really enable to recognize and appreciate the, the climate smart product, produced food. And finally, uh, very strategic actors are the policy makers who are uh, the only ones that have the capacity and the specific rule to boost uh, the innovative solution. Solution come from science, but go to policy. Uh, so what can be done, I would say, to, uh, to dedicate continuous attention to transfer processes allowing uh, science finding to be part of the real world. So the scientific results uh, do not stay in the scientific uh, world, but become operational, become tangible solution to support climate smart production processes. We said that the pillar are three, sustainability, resilience, and mitigation. And even if the science uh, um, strives to produce results, to embrace the three of them, uh, action at a global scale are really unachievable because we have all time to consider the differences between the, the, the region, um, the climate, the geography, the social, uh, the, 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 the political aspect. So local scale adapted solution must, must be considered. In, practic in practice uh, then uh, the approach uh, is holistic as we said, but application must be uh, contextualized. So uh, thought and applied which contest. So the next slide, I'm almost finish. Uh, is, sorry, okay. In such a spirit, uh, uh, an effort has been provided by the Academia de Giorgotti in the last month when we, when the lockdown was in some way uh, awakening an higher common attention um, 
towards the rising uh, social, economic, uh, health problem. Uh, we try to extract information from, um, from science and archive them uh, in this initiative, the Academia for the Period Post-COVID, um, to archive them um, innovations that were mature, uh, prepared for um, in simple version uh, to be fruitful for the production, um, by the production uh, sector by the technician, by the farmers, by SMEs, uh, and the site is updated weekly. So uh, a lot of uh, members of the geography are active to do that. So contribution, you may see here, some titles are different, but uh, many are climate environment, but not only. Uh, but all they are willing to support the step up of a sustainable food production chain and to favor this uh, ecological transition path. So is my last slide. Um, what uh, we did, it was try, this initiative was really uh, intended to be a contribution to enabling our environment, uh, in which the instrument to, um, uh, was the next slide and last one, please. Um, I'm sorry that I was not able to share the screen probably. Um, uh, so we consider what we did as a contribution to enabling the environment, which uh, the instrument, uh, we, we provided the instrument to boost innovation um, that flow from science to policy and government uh, in line, of course, with the aim of today meeting to foster a coordinate action uh, agenda and to move to a systemic approach to to make our agriculture uh, to go towards a, uh, an ecological transition. I thank you very much with uh, this last uh, slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Federica. Uh, we do believe that uh, systemic approach together with an enabling environment uh, is really what we need to push for in our G20 countries so that uh, farmers, not only in uh, a specific region, but across uh, uh, all countries can really share practice uh, trustworthy. Now I welcome to Dr. Martinucci, he's uh, the director of this Institute of Bioeconomy, because uh, sometimes trust is not only about uh, you know, people, but it's also about um, system. Good morning, good morning to everybody and uh, thanks for the invitation. Good morning, good morning to everybody and thanks for the invitation. I hope you can hear me. I will share my screen. Can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So, uh, thanks for the invitation, and um, uh, and thanks to all the other speakers that uh, actually uh, uh, gave already a, a a picture of the uh, of the situation in which we are living, and uh, I will try to address. Uh, 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 and contribute to the discussion, uh, uh, trying to assess the sustainability of future food production. <clears throat> we, have a, uh, we have a challenge, uh, a grand challenge for agriculture and natural resources, that is to double agricultural production and uh, reducing the use of resources. And uh, so we have to, to use sustainable intensification and multifunctionality. Actually, the, the water, food, energy nexus that also were, was targeted by Angelo Riccaboni is uh, we have to face increasing food needs. Uh, we have uh, raising population and changing dietary, dietary style. We have to use and reduce uh, limiting resources. We have to uh, make, have more efficient use of resources for agriculture. And we have to mitigate the and, uh, we still have to produce uh, sustainably food, feed, and also forest sourcing, and also to adapt to climate change. 
Actually, for the sustainability agriculture, this is the example of the use of water. 70% of fresh water is used for agriculture with different, uh, according to the different region of the world. But still, uh, mm -hmm. more than 80% of the damage and loss in agriculture is related to drought. And maybe also uh, for this reason that uh, the, the agriculture is using a lot of uh, water. Also, uh, agriculture is uh, uh, a potential threat to, to diversity. You see here the diversity in 2000 and 2030, and actually agriculture and infrastructure are the major uh, problems that may we, we will have for the, for the future. Also, we have to mention that the land has changed a lot. Historically, we have population and also in terms of socioeconomic organization, we have less farmer. In this uh, red uh, uh, rectangle uh, uh, at the end of the, of the slide, you see the, the, let's say, our area and, uh, and also the, 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 the red uh, thin line is uh, the present. So in the future, we may have less farmer, but still uh, to feed uh, more people. Also, we had a change, you, you see changing in the, in the cover of Europe since nine, nine, 1900. And actually, the, uh, we have increased a lot of the, the forest and grassland and also the city cover of our uh, planet. So this is related to intensification of the agriculture, surely, and also to global trends and import that uh, uh, maybe we are unsurely, as Riccardo Valentini showed, we are importing a lot from, from abroad. But actually, what about the future? We, we may uh, consider the potential of land sparing. So just to dedicate uh, and to uh, increase the efficiency of resource use in, in some of the uh, more uh, suitable fields and then to reduce the pressure in other fields. So here is a modeling uh, uh, analysis you see on the left, the current situation, and actually, if we, if the model are are fit with the maximum land sparing, so, so to increase the efficiency of use and uh, and to use the uh, most suitable land, we may have 50% less need of agricultural lands still producing the same amount of food. And if we, if we have a targeted land sparing scenario, so considering reducing the pressure in the biodiversity hotspot and uh, uh, in 40% uh, less need in the future if we properly uh, uh, make more efficient our production. And actually, the, the, two, the two scenarios are uh, 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 get with the same use of resources even more efficient. Also, we have crop diversification. This could be a tool for biodiversity and uh, to maintain all ecosystem service. This is a, a nice meta-analysis just came out in June, uh, considering uh, agroforestry, cover crop, cultivar mixture, and intercropping, more than 5,000 experiments uh, all over the world, uh, although there were uh, mixing situation in different regions. And actually, the green line is the zero. Everything that is on the right of the green line is improvement, and actually, Using these uh, uh, crop diversification strategies, uh, there is the, an improvement or almost all uh, the uh, supporting services, but also on, on the uh, provisioning. to uh, potentially assess the suitability of land for, uh, let's say, uh, intensive, intensive agriculture, biodiversity, hotspot. For example, here is the yield suitability map, unstable, the areas that are not uh, suitable for uh, agricultural production. So just a few cents for final reflection. I will try to be positive. Actually, we know that big challenges come together with big opportunities. We know the risk, actually, uh, the, the, the previous speaker have uh, talked a lot about risk. We are aware that we have to act 
maybe not enough, this is a question mark. Actually, we have the tools and the people, researcher and farmer particularly, but also capacity building is key as Federica Rossi just pointed out. And basically we have to move to sustainable and diversified intensification for conventional and intensive and, or, and even organic agriculture. So this is our target. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, um, um, Your talk uh, left me with uh, two points. Uh, one is the huge opportunity we have in front of us, uh, like 50 or 40% efficiency gap on, on land use. Use it's, uh, it's it's huge, and also the value of cooperation in agriculture goes beyond uh, you know what we know uh, as cooperative because there is this cooperation on, on data, like something that we can really capture together and use uh, um, in uh, in um, in bulk to change our system. And with that, uh, I would like to welcome Mao Tumbito, which is. Uh, 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 connected and thank you for waiting. Uh, I'm sorry for the 15 minutes delay. Uh, he's director of CNR Institute of Sustainable Plant Protection, and uh, um, he's going to talk about change of direction from uh, urgent climate threats and professor to be The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, can you can you can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much again for the invitation and for giving me this opportunity to to contribute to this very important um, conference. Well, uh, I go back to um, to re to the risks. Because we all know that we are facing grand uh, trends, grand challenges that will, will likely uh, disrupt the food and nutrition security as we are moving from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. And we could risk to move from the green, greenhouse, um, greenhouse climate state to the hothouse climate state. Now, if we look at this graph, which shows the temperature fluctuation changes over the past 100,000 years. Um, we can see that uh, most of these 100,000 years were covered by, were, were characterized by glacial period. With the difference of the last 12,000 years, which is um, the current epoch co called Holocene. The Holocene, it is a very stable uh, epoch that the, um, in fact, the maximum temp temperature variability on Earth during this during the Holocene has been plus minus one degree. Uh, the Holocene is the only equilibrium state of our planet that we know that would could support our world. During the Holocene, environmental changes occurred uh, naturally, and Earth regulatory capacity maintained the condition that enabled uh, the uh, basically the human development, the great European civilization, nowadays uh, civilization. But we are moving from the whole scene to um, a new uh, era. If we look at, at the, this graph, the, the IPCC uh, report on 2014 shows that we, without any mitigation uh, measures, uh, the, the earth temperature will go up by, uh, by 4.5 degrees. So this is, means that we are moving to a new epoch, the Anthropocene, in which the human uh, action can may be the major driver of global, global environmental changes with um, potential catastrophic, um, catastrophic consequence for uh, a large part of the world. So this increase in temperature, 4.5, has no precedent in, in human history. The work by Bark et al. in 2010 shows, please see the blue line, that if this unmitigated increase in temperature occurs, 4.5 degrees, we actually go back by the climate, uh, Earth climate goes back by 20, 10, 20 uh, million of years and the Pliocene in the Eocene is can provide the best analog for the future climate. Even um, 
by 2030, we did uh, any mitigation measures, the, the temperature would go up, could go up by 2.5 degrees. This means that we uh, rewind the climate back to 3 million of years. This is something that we, in the human uh, history, has never experienced. And this is challenge very much the, capac the capacity uh, to, um, of, uh, of adapting to climate change. So because this could also um, cause the so-called global cascade of tipping points, the, the points of no return, that will uh, basically cause uh, the transition to a less, um, ha um, less habitable hot house climate state. For more details, please uh, see this paper, um, this paper published in 2010, trajectory uh, of Earth, um, of Earth basically uh, towards the, the, the Anthropocene. And also why we should state it is very important to have a peaceful and sustainable development, to have a, a, to remain in a, in a Holocene-like state. This is very important. Also because uh, in the future, it is quite clear, so the agriculture land covers about 50% of the total habitable land. And in the future, it is that this land will, will basically will may not change. The, the, um, the uh, habitable, the agriculture land will stay in a quasi, uh, will remain in a quasi uh, stable um, because, because uh, we have, okay, Ricardo Valentini showed that there is a lot of deforestation, but deforestation land, um, deforest, deforestation is very um, fragile, it degrades very, very uh, rapidly. And, and if we don't stop deforestation, and we will run in a huge problem uh, of a disaster in accelerating climate change. So uh, crop land, it is expected not to, um, to uh, increase in the future and 77% uh, it is in, it is used for livestock meat and dairy and only 20% 23% for growing crops and so as george was was saying we have to we need we must increase uh, productivity of this land uh, with new technological uh, break, breakthrough and also because uh, we are facing um, the, the soil ceiling is increasing worldwide, especially in Italy, we have a huge problem. Every year we lose about 17 hectares per day of, because of soil ceiling. This is, uh, brings another um, issue. Uh, our beautiful and gorgeous Mediterranean diet. This graph shows uh, what is the share, the share of uh, ha habitable land that could be used to agriculture if everyone in the world would uh, adopt the same uh, uh, diet. So our Italy is here just below France. So if everyone in the in the world would adopt the mediterranean diet we would need 120 percent of uh, habitable land so this is not sustainable and this may cause a lot of problem for italy for european countries um the because of of uh, land degradation because of increase in uh, in in population, uh, the cropland available for uh, for for per capita cropland available uh, has already gone down. In 2013, it was 0.2 hectares. Nowadays, it is 0.117 hectares. And with soil with soil ceiling in Italy, we may face by in a few years a global uh, food shortage. And generally speaking, in, if the current agricultural system will remain unchanged, unchanged we can expect a global shortage of two, two, um, 214 trillion calories by 2027. And in the Mediterranean, Gamenos uh, Mastroeni explained very well why uh, the Mediterranean is, is a hot spot for climate change, because the Mediterranean is covered by drylands. Dryland means that crop agricultural productivity is limited by water. And if we look at the future, uh, the scenario is very, uh, is very dramatic, because um, 
Italy is among Italy and the whole Mediterranean uh, are among the, the countries. Italy is among the countries with that, that will face in the future serious um, serious water shortage. About thirty percent of probability that we will face uh, water shortage. So we know that we have to increase water productivity. We know we have to increase uh, water. Um, water efficiency we need to we know that we have to produce more crops per crops but uh, we have to maintain a, a stable planet we have to maintain our planet in, planet in the holocene like state because if we um, run into the anthropocene it will be a disaster and we the whole system will collapse so um, to do that in the face of of um, of increasing human pressure and shocks we need a radical thinking we need to go into a transformative disruptive future and address these six major transformation that are interconnected the human capacity consumption production decarbonization digital revolution smart seats and of course food biosphere now we have to reorient our research policy uh, to confront the perfect storm of global threats and challenges that are threatening our food future and agriculture agricultural systems uh, in italy then we have also another major transformation to need to stop uh, soil saving so what are we doing in in cnr together with francesco loreto that we speak uh, a little bit later last year we started uh, a joint research uh, center with the italian national um, uh, national gas and uh, and oil um, company called water high pass uh, that is Sandra. it is based in the meta pond in the southern italy in, in thailand basically and in this center we are tackling all the problem water related to agriculture um, we, we we will mostly work on two main aspects of agriculture management starting new um, advanced high throughput platforms for plant phenotyping and not and then uh, developing new prototypes that will be operating from next year basically to treat and reuse urban wastewater urban wastewater for irrigation of course urban wastewater it is a huge issue very important because in, in many areas of the mediterranean in dry in dry areas it is the only source of fresh water available for agriculture and there is no competition for this fresh water so that's what we are doing and we ho do hope that this uh, new um, a research center, joint research, research center, will be a, a kind of um, a, of uh, important uh, strategic uh, research center for the Mediterranean for the water issues um, in agriculture. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you we learn that uh, nothing is sustainable at the global level we need to act locally and um, but local uh, things can really impact the global scale like in migrations and uh, uh, climate uh, threats so we spoke about that uh, with Daniel uh, Pasini I asked him to stay on the clock otherwise we cannot uh, finish our meeting uh, Okay, th th thank you very much uh, to the organizers for my invitation and to the previous colleagues uh, for having just uh, uh, done a very big step towards the nexus between agriculture and food. Uh, I would like to, to share my screen now. I will see if, uh, if I can. Okay. Can you see my, my screen, my presentation? Yes, okay, thank you very much. I would like to, uh, to speak about very briefly about the nexus between climate change and agriculture, but also the impacts on conflicts and migrate and human migration in the world. So uh, very briefly, uh, uh, as well known, uh, the increase in CO2 concentration uh, can be positive for, for uh, uh, for the growing of plants, no? 
but uh, but uh, if we exclude the importance of other parameters like temperature or changes in the water cycle, if we take all together, we have to model our situation. And in the world, this is the situation from a paper by Francesco Tugiello of the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, published some years ago in a, in a book edited by me. And the situation is quite simple. If we consider just the influence on climate change on the growing of cereal plants here. So this, this, this is an index of growing of cereals. As you can see in the so-called developed countries, that is to say uh, USA, Canada, Europe, Russia, Siberia, and so on, uh, we will see an increase in production, in agricultural production, due to the increase of CO2, of course, but also to the increase of water availability at these high latitudes, and also to the fact that some terrain like that of Siberia can be uh, free from permafrost in, in the future. So it, uh, the steering can be used for agricultural, uh, for agricultural development. So there is an increase here, but in the so-called developing or poor countries, there is a very clear, there will be a very clear decrease because of, okay, in very high temperature, very uh, shortage of, of uh, rainfall, um, resources and so on. So you can see that climate change uh, tends to um, exacerbate the, the, in, 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 uh, the inequity, the, the uh, inequity that there is in the world in the production of, of agriculture. But uh, uh, climate change has also an uh, impact uh, not only on agriculture, but also on conflicts and migrations, uh, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly between, uh, by means of uh, lack of uh, uh, yields. Uh, this, I, I will, I will uh, track uh, very simply just two examples. This is the example of a Syrian crisis uh, which was seated before just uh, from uh, by uh, Garamenos Mastroieni in his, uh, in his talk. Uh, here we had uh, from 2007 to 2010 a very severe drought uh, and uh, the, the, the farmers lose completely their yield. They migrated uh, towards uh, Syrian cities. And of course, in the in the degraded peripheries, and there there were conflicts for the water resources, but also for food. And if you think that there were there was a speculation on the prices of the food, and there were there was a, a quite corrupt regime, you can see that here this very drought, very severe drought, which was almost impossible in the pre-global pre warming conditions uh, created and uh, triggered a, a crisis in the, civilian, uh, the civil, uh, uh, Syrian war, which uh, le led uh, more than one million people towards the Balkanic route towards uh, Europe. So uh, really, uh, biblical, uh, biblical exodus of, of people through the Balkanic route. But you, you know very well that uh, migrants in, in Europe uh, comes also from these uh, boats. And you know these boats uh, uh, depart uh, from, uh, from Libya, but the migrants uh, here come from uh, the 90% of these migrants uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, reach Libya uh, come from uh, the so-called Sahelian region, which is a region in which uh, there are 10 uh, fragile countries because they are, uh, they are characterized by very fragile economy uh, based especially on a purely substance-tense agriculture. And uh, uh, here, the, the climate change is not a, a primary cause of migration, but is a cofactor. Is, is, it is a co-driver of, uh, of conflicts and migration. Why? Because here uh, there is 
of course, a climatic problem. That is to say desertification. You see here, the Sahara is coming south uh, and the, the degraded lands became, become uh, gradually uh, land of desert. But there are also other problems such as conflicts and food riots in this, in this, in this region. And also, for instance, terrorist attacks. So here, the, the climate change is not a primary cause which trigger by itself a conflict or immigration like in Syria, but it is a cofactor which amplifies and accelerated the, the crisis just existing there. A, a very clear example is the situation of the Lake Chad. The Lake Chad is in the middle of the Sahelian region. You can see here the blue surface uh, is the area of water in the middle of 60s. You can see in the 2000s what uh, is become this, this area. There's, there is a reduction of 17 times of the surface of water there. Of course, this thing. is not due only by climate change, but also by incorrect uh, actions on water, uh, detection on incorrect detection of water and so on. But at, at the end, the situation is this. That is to say that in this situation, farmers and shepherds are in conflict, in conflict for water resources. So some conflict become to, uh, to, to be there and some internal migrations. And then when the last chance for these people is to achieve, is to reach Libya and to come to Europe. So this is the situation. This, uh, these are the migration from Syria through the Balkanic route. These are the migration from the Sahelian region through the Mediterranean. So uh, how also, much we, is important climate only, change is it in this situation? Uh, we know that uh, uh, recently, there were the, Ara the so-called Arabian Springs. There are a lot of conflicts of other origin. That is to say, for instance, ethnic conflicts. So in this study of two years ago, uh, Stefano Mendel and me wanted to, to study the importance of climate change before the Arabian Springs in order to see uh, better the, the, the influence of climate. Oh, as you can see here, we are in the period of uh, 2009, uh, sorry, 1995-2009. And we model the, the migration flows from these 10 countries to Italy through a nonlinear model in which we used just uh, meteoclimatic uh, uh, parameters like temperature, precipitation, the number of hours, during the growing season when the temperature was major, um, higher than 30 degrees Celsius. And also, these are direct influences from meteoclimatic events. And then also yields, which is uh, indirectly driven also by meteor meteorological and climatic events. So you can see the, red, the, the black line here is the observed migration from these 10 countries to Italy during the period 1995-2009. The red lines are the ensemble runs of our model, and the blue line in the, is the ensemble mean of our model. As you can see, we are able to explain almost the 80% of variance in the variability of the interannual migration from these countries to Italy. So this is a very important hint that also before, and especially before the Arabian Springs, climate change was very important for migration. Uh, now, in this situation, how to act for solving together climate change problem, migration problem, and so on. You can see here the Millennium Goals. We have, we have to act in a systemic uh, manner, not in a holistic manner, not in, in a technocratic man manner, because we have to solve one problem together with the others. And uh, this is an example of a win-win strategy. For instance, if, why not uh, 
uh, to uh, recover the degraded lands of the Syrian uh, belt. How to do this? It, it is quite simple because uh, in this uh, lands uh, there is uh, uh, always a rainfall during the, the rainfall season, but the rainfall is uh, so heavy that is not absorbed by the by the terrain. So if you make uh, big holes where the rainfall um, uh, can uh, stay for days and weeks and so on, at the end of the of the uh, rainfall season, we have, uh, for instance, a pasture. This has a very little cost, $100 per hectare. And these costs are very lower than the cost of, uh, I don't know, mi mi militarization of the Mediterranean, of the walls, and so on. So we have to go toward, toward these uh, synergic strategies. The last uh, slide is uh, this. Uh, Okay. On, on this uh, cascade of phenomena, because we don't have to think locally, but we have to think globally. Because in this example, the ice melting and the Arctic amplification towards a cascade of phenomena can influence the drought in the cell. Okay, I leave you just two uh, little references. The first one is a book of mine and Granmenos Mastroieni that unfortunately is only in Italian for, for the moment. And uh, this one is the study in which uh, uh, Stefano Mendel and me studied the, the uh, migrations from the Sahelian belt to Italy before the uh, so-called Arabia Straits. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much. I, something that really uh, captures my attention is that, uh, like William Gibson says, that the future is already here. It's just not, it's just not evenly distributed. So we are looking at also our future if we don't act uh, by looking at what's happening in the sub-Saharan Africa. And um, with that, I would ask to uh, Francesco Loreto to give the final word of this session. I ask him to be very concise. Uh, he's professor of plant physiology at the University of Naples, Rico Secondo, and also president of ISPA CNR and uh, uh, long friend of Future Food Institute. Uh, professor Loreto. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I am, uh, I am uh, aware of the fact that the time <laughs> is very short and uh, I actually it's very easy when you, when you end uh, a session with so many uh, fantastic speakers uh, who really uh, set the ground and said about everything I could, I could also say. So let's share my presentation. Uh, let's see if I can, can you see my presentation? I don't know if, uh, if you are yes, seeing. Yes. Okay, uh, I try to, okay, now you should see uh, full screen. Um, okay, um, uh, I, as, a, as it was said, uh, I, was, uh, I am a, a professor at the University of Naples, Federico II, and, uh, and also a, a member of the Scientific Committee of Città della Scienza. So the first slide is actually an advertisement for Città della Scienza. Uh, and this is uh, the next uh, uh, edition of Futuro Remoto, the Festival of Science, the Città della Scienza every year uh, prepare. And, uh, and uh, this year will be about transition. So exactly what uh, has been discussed so far, particularly uh, in our case, the ecology uh, transition. Um, now I will go really, really fast because uh, this is just a recap of what uh, everyone has said. And I'm very, very um, uh, glad to say that, uh, to see and to say that uh, uh, rarely I've seen so much uh, consensus uh, uh, among scientists. <laughs> In general, scientists argue a lot about their ideas and, uh, and uh, Strength, uh, strongly support uh, very contrasting ideas, but this is not the case. Uh, I, I can, I can see. So uh, there are drivers of the of the uh, crisis uh, that uh, we have. It's a real crisis now, 
um, the population increase has driven uh, the consumption of uh, uh, fossil fuel. Fossil fuel are in has increased the CO2 in the atmosphere and this has uh, raised the temperature. And this trend is continuing uh, and we need uh, uh, more and more energy, more and more water and more and more food. In the Paris Agreement in 2015, and now the 2030 Agenda with their Sustainable Development Goals. Mauro Centrit has shown uh, the risk of going uh, from a greenhouse earth to a hot house earth. This is exactly what we are um, we are uh, experiencing. Uh, for the humanity and for agriculture and answer drought so it's a limit in particular extreme events I, I didn't hear a lot about extreme events but we have a very good example dated a few few days ago in Germany so we know you know what I am talking about let let me address very very rapidly this from the from the plant side from the vegetation side. Well, vegetation has three options since plants don't move. Uh, well, they move very slowly uh, and they so they can migrate, but uh, generally migration is too slow. Be better for the 2080 uh, projection. So the new green revolution must be based on three concepts: at least uh, adapt, be resilient, optimize the use of resources, and find the new resources. And uh, the good news is that uh, climate smart agriculture, as we have seen also previously, as an armament of new technology. And, and, uh, so bad you see that so, Roberto, maybe you can try to remove the video close. sorry sorry can maybe you can me? try to remove yeah you can remove the video because uh, the sound comes uh, quite noisy okay but now i am in the uh stop video okay switch off your camera so that maybe we can yeah, uh, hear I, I did it i did it yeah so i hope that now is better so europe cares this is the other good news uh because uh, uh, there is uh, the europe Thank you. 
do. If we stop, Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you, Professor Lorenzo. Um, actually, uh, I feel that uh, we need to act a little bit as translator with this digital um, digital uh, technology. The take of message uh, I really share with you because um, it's incredible uh, the power of plants and the power that can reach uh, research can give to plant if we can if we are able to increase photosynthesis and to really you know reduce uh, the level of CO2 in our uh, atmosphere. So thank you very much to all our speakers. Sorry for being a little late. Sarah, welcome back here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matteo. It's always a very big... Uh, it's always a very big challenge to follow the live uh, online and the real, in real time, in real life. We know that online uh, everything was, uh, was going well. So we're going to take our time to really hear and pay attention to all the beautiful presentation and meaningful pre presentations we have been hearing this, this morning. Here we are. I, I think we had so many inspiration and we had the clear understanding on how urgent is the, the issue, how fast we have to act. And I would love to invite here with me for this little closing, the ambassador Pierre Benbust. He is uh, uh, the permanent representative at the UN in Rome from Switzerland. And I wanted to invite Pio with me because um, today we are starting a journey. Matteo was mentioning a little bit before about what we are doing. And today we're starting a journey here in Naples where the big ministers from all the 20 countries are meeting, but uh, the Food for Earth uh, journey started many years ago, and in this week uh, is going to start to connect policymakers, scientists, but also youth, young activists and innovators, farmers. And so from now on, we're going to start to connect the dots. So this afternoon, we're going to move in a campus that is entirely inspired to integral ecology. And from tonight, uh, we are going to start to talk with uh, 
young, bright minds. We have been talking a lot about transition. We have been talking a lot about transformation. And this is the reason why I wanted to have Pio Venus, because he started an incredible project that is called Bites of Transformation, that he transformed even in transformation. And so I think that Pio, with the mind of the diplomats, with the long experience uh, in diplomacy, really identify which is probably what we need now. So involve bright and young mind and young energy to start to fill this gap. Pio, help us to close this very dense morning and very challenging morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's a nice question. Thank you for inviting us. We came a, a small group that we are actually, that the group of young ones are not only witnessing, but actually leading this. Uh, uh, kind of process that we started that is the name is bites of transformation it's because it doesn't want to be pretension bites means just give some bites it's not we know perfectly that it's not just two or three or a one single initiative that is going to change the the world but there is a, what is important is this kind of uh, initiatives start going in the same direction and therefore we would like to thank already the organizers of the food for Hearth g20 edition to having us here um so i try to be brief um and you know i mean you've been hearing all the this morning how difficult it is to be brief and how is difficult even though we are living in a in you know, sometimes with digitalization, even though this will be part of our future, they were brought up, even though sometimes uh, uh, interrupted by the in the conversation, we quite clear. Now, what is not clear, at least to to us and maybe even to me, as represented in Switzerland to the United Nations in Rome to the food, uh, let's say, food hub, is how we get to this famous political will that gets all of us together going the same direction. And is there a same direction? As I start, as, as to say. Um, and maybe what I, I could say is systems don't change unless the perception that is needed, that they have to change is becoming impressive. So unless it's an innovation that kicks in from outside in a very strong manner, uh, big changes come with crisis. Okay, now everybody's been talking about crisis, and now what we, the problem with crisis is that actually within crisis solutions are already there, but we are so much taken by the crisis, crisis feeling that we actually, all what we do is tend to be a reaction to what is happening. So what we were trying to see is that it's, it's, it's quite simple with bites of transformation. So when uh, Secretary General Gutierrez uh, decided to convene the Food System Summit in 21, he did it on the concept of urgency. This came from the Future Is Now presentation of Greta Thunberg and one of the pillar that was considered not sustainable is the food. Either, right, um, and so at the beginning, as as, as as other countries as well, we thought, okay, this will be we will get to the duration of right, of stays most probably through an intergovernmental negotiation process. And then in the past, we have been witnessing already negotiating processes like um, transboundary management of water. How is difficult it is to even get a word transboundary water management into the political arena because of the interests. Now you can imagine food systems are very complex and interests are diverse at least and even divergent. So it's very difficult to actually imagine at the political level, we just 
a simple two years long process to come to something that is something that all countries on earth will buy in. We've, and we've seen it. We've seen it in the preparatory process of the, of the food system. So I mean, it's not that easy. It will be a very good declaration. It's not the point. The declaration will be there. It will be a good one. The point is this will be the legitimacy of this declaration. Since there will no, be no intergovernmental negotiation. So countries might opt in or opt out from this declaration according to their interests and their will. Unless what is the intention to transform an intergovernmental negotiation into a people summit, and this is the reason why we are here in this moment as a representative of the public, if you want, of the public sector in, in, this, uh, in the Food for Earth, Earth meeting. Uh, the, the point is trying to transform this process in the people, in a people summit. This means bringing the legitimacy of the work that all you are doing. Now we said, okay, that's very easy to say. And how we do it? How, how we, in the words of the experience of the cooperative system of the Emilia Romagna, except that I know it a bit because I studied in Bologna many years ago, but <laughs> um, how, how we keep the unifying element that is needed in order to have a, a, a shared political will, because this is not obvious. So we decided to set up uh, this uh, project by self transformation. And, and also we said, okay, instead of talking about prizes, let's take some of the givens for the future. The, the population dynamics are clear. There will still increase the population. There will still rapid urbanization is going on. In Africa, it's very rapid. Climate change, now you see, you received all the information needed if still necessary. It's given, including the water and other livelihood assets. Um, uh, resources, access to the resources, digitalization, technologies, and so on will go on, will will improve, we, we will get there. So this means interconnectivity will be much stronger in the future. The use of tech can be, if it's done in a smart manner, can actually work. Now the point is that work for what if you don't have a unifying message? And this is what we try to do. We say, okay, let's have a look. You could, let's project ourselves into a future, a 50, 20 years in the future. And in order to do that, it doesn't make any sense that I'm doing it. I'm at the end, if you want, of, of my working time. So let's have a group of young ones that are sitting there, among others. You project yourself into the future. And you see if you manage to agree on where you want to go. Where do you see? Where, where you, you want to see yourself in two, 15 years. I know it's very heavy asking this. <laughs> it's not working. So we perfectly know it's not putting a burden, but it's simply saying, okay, if you can spell out in a unified manner what, what you would see as your future, then here we today can still act and do something for you. Because actually, we have to do something. It's not just simply the future is yours, you go, right? The future is yours. Tell us where you would like to go, and then we try to help you out. Okay. And this is basically the so also the messages of several foundations that are supporting projects is a little bit going in this direction. So this bits of transformation basically transforms itself in a process where only one rule was there. The 50 or 60 participants from the area, Switzerland, Italy, Mediterranean, and then got a bit larger, Hong Kong, Latin America, and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. The young ones had a simple task. Look at the population dynamics and so on, what I said at the beginning, that they will be as a given. We know that changing habitats means also changing habits. If you are living in Cairo and working in the city, you are not going to commute back at home, whether you have money or whether you're working, exactly as, as it is in Zurich or in Lagos. Simply the conditions are different, right? But you have to set up a system that works there as well for urbanized switch. Okay, so basically only we give only one rule. The rule is 
work on something that is unifying you and not dividing you. Whenever you are not agreeing on something, okay, you might disagree, but then come with a, a proposal and you discuss it within the group. This was one element. The second element is that all the young ones are not doing the same business. Some are, one is an architect, the other one is a farmer, a third one is a, is a, uh, is a chef, a fourth one runs a restaurant, and so on. There is one city planner, et cetera, et cetera. All people with completely divergent interests. And non, not all of them are knowledgeable of food systems. Okay, they together, they did something that for me already found it a, a small miracle. They created a manifesto, manifesto just to page, not linked to time, not linked to space, but the one you want to see your future. And then from there, deriving something in common, defining in common. And of course, it gets to the point that you have to modify your habits, your habitats. And, and when you change systems, this means changing a lot of stuff, right? Then from there, deriving some few lines of action and even projects. This is the point that I'm trying to make to conclude. If you want to change a system, it is not saying that all of us, we have to produce in the same manner, or all of us, we have to eat the same thing. No, but all of us, we have to have an image of how far and where we want to go in general as societies. And then you apply, according to this situation, you apply your ideas in a different manner. We have a project that came up, how you change the life in a refugee camp. Refugee camp were thought to stay there for five years. They are there for 70, 80 years, and actually they are cities but still they cannot produce in the refugee camp because of political reasons and so on. Still they depend on WFP bringing its bag of rice 70 years after. Does it make any sense? No, it doesn't make sense. So you can apply this, this manifesto, if you want ideas, to this reality, but also to the reality of Switzerland, my one, that is a very urbanized agriculture. Why we had a vote just a few weeks ago, um, so many of them of my of the Swiss guys are quite disappointed. But actually, if you look at the result of this vote, it made perfect sense. The vote went it was about eliminating pesticides in agriculture totally, right? And it went, I think, 45 positive and 55 negative. And no, so it didn't go through. You know that Switzerland is a country where we vote for, right? Which is actually good. Um, and then if you look at the granularity of the 45%, you could find that cities more than 50,000 people living there, they voted yes. The more you go to villages that are part intrinsically of the rural reality and rural production, which is intertwined, they, they are a little more cautious because they don't know how we do that. Not because they don't want it, but they don't know how to do it now. So, by taking these elements, then you can come up with projects that actually are using the capacities of research centers, institutions, policy advisors, and so on and so on, but with a purpose. This is what we are trying to say. Do it, but with purpose. We want to get, and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the people following us online and thank you all for being so patient today. I think that you reached the point. We need to involve them as much as we can uh, and we need to involve the broader society in this complex system as much as we can. Thank you all and enjoy and follow the works inside the G20 summit, but also spread the world and get in touch with the ones that are activating communities, uh, innovation centers, in accelerators. So be part of the change. Thank you, thank you, thank you.